This is the Grantastic Podcast. Welcome to Grantastic, Sebastian. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing all right. You know, it's a little cold out, but you know, that's okay. Yeah, this whole San Francisco has two seasons. Um, really doesn't talk about the transition phase, huh? Not, not, not at all. Not. <laughs> I was like, cause I just moved to the Bay this like past fall, and you know, I'm from you know California, Sacramento, and everything. But I was like ready for the rain. I got my '90s nostalgic music ready. You know, the whole deal, and it's just straight sunny. And I'm like, yeah, we we got an early start to spring. Um, what is the headliner in your spring playlist? The spring, that's, see, that's a good question. I guess, I mean, are we talking any genre or are we just like, if we're talking like, it would, my spring playlist, it's all bossa nova. So, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, we got like, I think Tom Jobin's one of his songs. It's, uh, I don't want to butcher the, the name out of it. It's like August or Augusto something. Um, it's his famous one. But, uh, you know, I'm going to look it up just because we're here and so many people are going to Okay, it's Auguste de Marco. I think that's about the rain or something. Um, yeah, I'm looking it up. But that's like, that. I like, I have straight bossa nova for spring and summer. That's like my go-to genre. If, um, just to build on that, um, a record that's just been playing back and forth in my head has been Stan Getz. Oh, Yeah amazing yeah he's he's got some good ones also in the bosa nova department so definitely worth the visit uh perfect for like a morning a slow morning yeah definitely like it's just like you know um you're just kind of your perfect slow morning or uh your sunday type of music sunday morning music or whatever you want to call it so um yeah, the one that I'm thinking about is uh, the one he did with Charlie Bird. It's called Jazz Samba. Oh, I haven't I haven't heard that. I might need to check that one out. Yeah, I'll leave it to you as a little gift that I found. And I had to cheat. I had to kind of look it up, and it's been the one that's kind of like in my repeat. Um, and every time, like, I tell my phone or something at my house to play music, it goes to that song, so, like, to that album. So I definitely recommend it. Amazing, amazing! I love it. Well, what what what's your favorite type of music? I mean, we're already on the subject, so like, what? Yeah, screw photography. Let's talk about music. Uh, <laughs> I'll probably burn a lot of bridges trying to talk about music uh, from a lot of your listeners, but um, I'm really into rock. To be fair, um, mostly indie rock. Um, so it really depends on the mood, the time. You know, I'll kind of float that way. Um, yeah, and one of my favorite bands actually somebody just made me realize i i became old the minute that one of my favorite bands growing up became stadium rock okay um so those would be the foo fighters um a good band at some moment yeah at some moment they just became kind of staple house stadium rock dad rock kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, which is mind-blowing to think that i've gotten that old that fast because when i grew up to them it was like you know you would pop in, you know, um, you know, the first record and, and you just kind of listen to kind of like garage rock. And now all of a sudden they're like selling out, you know, it's like that grunt every freaking stadium. Yeah. Yeah. I feel, I mean, like if we're going that era, like, you know, like counting crows, Dave Matthews band, um, Mazzy stars. Um, that's like a uh, hook. Watching Dave Matthews live is one of the coolest experiences I've had. I, oh. I'm not a big Dave Matthews fan, but like, live hell he just puts on a show yeah it's amazing because i mean they're jam bands i mean he's a jam band so it's just like it's interesting like they'll jam out and then they'll hang out and it's just like you it's so different i guess like you said like from any other band because like they have sets and stuff but there they're just hanging out and they're drinking beers and it's such a yeah unique, uh atmosphere watching he doesn't even care what he walks into stage with he's just like yeah i'm here to do my thing 100%. He's he's really cool. Um, yeah, any of that type of music, I just like, I mean, I love all types of music. Um, just because like, 
it's it creates different moods and feels and all the certain types of vibes and stuff but actually and, and there's a connection between like music and photography um I don't, I don't know how many people do it but i mean if you do go on a photo walk with the music it does kind of influence the mood of what you're visualizing and what your composition for mm -hmm. um even the colors that you're kind of fixing on like if you're listening to you know if you're feeling metallica you'll probably end up doing a little bit more of you know some deeper photos whereas in, you know, if you're listening to some bossa nova you might just be kind of doing some street photography and kind of just like dancing with people um that's like guess my way of defining street photography i think i think that's like a great like you know compares i didn't even think about it like that you know like my main like job and stuff is audio engineering and, and the photography is, is the hobby but like to yeah. have even idea right now just thinking about it that's such a because yeah i'll either a go by myself and like have you know headphones in listen to my music or go with people but yeah i think it really creates like that mindset you know what you're in if you're listening to a happy song you want to take some happy photos if you're listening to a like a sad song you're going to find something depressing or the rain is just a solid time to take the photos then or something yeah also when you're editing i don't know if it happens to you i don't know what you're you're scanning um or if you already get your photos scanned and processed for you but if i'm editing i i do kind of try to match it to if, i feel like everybody has their like editing playlist mm -hmm. um and it kind of helps define your works your workflow like you know, I'm, I'm working on, you know, uh, I use negative lab pro to kind of like process a lot of my scans from like negative to positive. And I feel like I'm kind of jamming with the music as I'm changing colors and hues and kind of going through it through the motions. I, I, I usually like, so I'm trying to get a board, like a board scanner right now to try and get into scanning, save money and everything because yeah, it's definitely the move, but the, right now in the moment, we just, we send it to someone. Um, but at least like when I take photos, I like to try to take a caption from a song, you know, some inspirable, you know, inspirational lyric. So lately I've been like, you know, right now, currently for this week, I'm just in SoCal and I'm heading back to SF and um, been doing a lot of Beach Boys, just Beach Boys or Tame Impala, anything like that indie surf kind of like. Yeah. Um, so we just try to find certain lyrics and then we try That's our caption for what this photo was representing or what we were in that uh, moment in life. I find that genius. Um, that reminds me, one of my favorite um, movies is actually of Beach Boys. And it's not a very go-to famous movie. Um, it has all the ingredients to be good, but it's uh, with John Cusack. Okay. Have you seen this one? I don't think so, but it sound, what is it called? Uh, it's with the lead singer. He's kind of like, um, I'm sure you know the history, like the lead singer had a, I believe a mental um, yeah brian breakdown. brian wilson the lead singer he yeah. had he did so much uh, uh lsd he had a oh god what's the i know what it is um it, it's the thing when you have like people talking to you in your head uh forget what it's called but he he had that um yeah it's uh, called love and mercy okay then okay Definitely have to and check he it. explores, so John Cusack plays the older version, and then the guy who's going to be the Riddler and the Batman plays the younger version, mm -hmm. and they're intertwining, but it, it talks a lot about the production of Pet Sounds, and sort of like how he had taken a step back from his like touring days, and just cooked up himself in the studio and just kind of came up with Pet Sounds. Yeah, and fun fact to add to that, like they were going against the Beatles when the Beatles, I think, dropped Sgt. Pepper when they heard it, yeah. or, or I forget, I don't know if it was them, and then the Beatles made Sgt. Pepper, it was one of the two, but they were going back and forth, those two bands of like, we got to do something better than what they did, and it's just a great, and like how they got to that creativity, and that, that's another thing, I feel like, because I was during like the 60s and 70s, like, like psychedelics were played a huge role, and I think without some of yeah. those, like, uh, plants, or whatever you want to call them, I don't think we would have some of the sounds that we had, especially with Brian Wilson, how he got so creative with like sound designing and like taking the whole nother level of like creating sound. It blows my mind. Yeah, which is interesting when you watch the, the documentary, the three, what is it? The seven hour documentary of the Beatles on um, yeah. Disney Plus. Uh, Disney Plus, thank you. Name dropping these. Um, They're good. And then you, you just kind of see like, yeah, bring a hammer over. Just bring a full hammer over and see what we can kind of do with it. Um, <laughs> it's amazing. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it could be such the same thing for photography. I mean, a lot of the photography pieces, a lot of people just kind of pushing that envelope and reacting to each other, right? Like you spoke about kind of uh, the Beach Boys reacting to the Beatles, right? Mm -hmm. um, photography is also to a certain degree that you look at somebody you admire professionally pushing the envelope and you kind of see how you could get uncomfortable and kind of push your envelope in there too. I feel like the arts in themselves have this comparison and building up on. Um, there's this beautiful um, documentary from way back in the early days of Kickstarter that's called Everything's a Remix. Mm. I don't know if you've heard of it, but the concept's pretty clear. It's everything we do is based on other people's original ideas and we built and remix on them. Basically, you can find anything in modern music, photography or art that is inspired or taken from somebody else and build upon with a different approach to it. Oh, I believe, I believe, I believe all creativity is, you know, inspired by something, you know, I, it's, um, you know, particularly like, at least like for me, just music, I see it. Photography, that's something I've been trying to like, you know, understand more because I'm just getting into and understanding it. And I think you see like, well, I was taking this example, I forget who I was talking about, about it with, but like, Everyone, you know, in San Francisco takes a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, that's just a picture everyone loves. But how you how you take it, I think, is how you can make it different. You know what I mean? I think that's how I think I've seen people getting inspired because there's one person takes a certain angle, another person takes another angle. And I think it creates a whole different mood, I feel. Uh, I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, specifically places like San Francisco. I feel like uniquely, you know, it's seven by seven miles. It's 49 square miles. It's been photographed, you know, every bit and corner of it. So it's about the ability of being able to bring a different eye and getting your own interpretation of what it makes you feel or what you're trying to document, right? I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, photography is a very personal work of art um, in the sense that you're putting your feelings out there and, and trying to make sure that what you're seeing is captured back into feelings, right? Whereas in if you were writing, you can literally put exactly what you're feeling into it. Whereas then when you're photographing, you have to make the elements work on behalf of what you're trying to document. And I think that becomes the challenge of photography. And the same could be said about like color versus black and white photography. Like it just gets harder because you have less elements to play with. Right. So yeah. how do you say more with less? Honestly? Yeah. I mean, but that's like where you, you had to use your mind and really try to like try to get out of the box because um i also i just love how we're just taking music and film and going back but this is just amazing love it because I, just side note like a lot of people who do listen to this are musicians or producers or whatever you want to call it and then now i'm getting more film people but love how we're taking yeah. it to make it interesting but going what you're saying i think um taking a music aspect uh for like, because I'm in grad school and stuff, one of the assignments was like, you can only use a piano and a kick and maybe, what was it? Piano, a kick drum, and I think it was uh, a triangle or something ridiculous. And he's like, try to make something creative with this shit. And I was like, okay. Um, real well, first I was gonna use the piano as my chord progression, but then he like started limiting, said you only can create like with two chords. And I'm like, well, fuck, now I really got to get super creative. How am I <laughs> supposed to write two minute, 30 minute song with like two chords and, and only sharps? Yeah, 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 exactly. And then what am I supposed to do with a kick drum in a triangle? Like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, I just like I took like I took a seventh chord and then I took like a, a nine flat chord and I just like broke them into pieces. And that's how I spread. So still two chords, but I spread them out and like um, playing them. So. And then the kick drum, I just kind of try to kick drum and try and go, just try to create some rhythm pattern. But yeah, I think yeah. really, you know, the the less, the more creative, I think. And I think like black and white, you were saying, it's definitely how do you, how do you like take that a film and get really creative? I try, I've done a little black and white, but it's very, you know, it's definitely, you got to get out there and be creative. I don't know about you, what, when you shoot black and white, what's your process? I mean, black and white, it's, I don't know if this happens to other people, but every time I go out, my behavior is like, I'm going to go shoot black and white. I'm going to go shoot black and white. It's, it's loaded. It's on my carrier. It's like literally what I have to shoot. It's the only thing I got to shoot. Uh, but once I'm out and actually trying to photograph, 
what happens to me is that I forget I'm shooting black and white and my head goes and reverts back to color. Um, and then it will happen to me at one point where I go like, shoot, I'm, I'm actually not shooting black, I mean, color, I'm shooting black and white. And it, what's interesting is that what I've learned over my honestly messing that up is that I can notice in my color approach, the things I call my attention in black and white. And then you go abstracting the colors and you get kind of like, yes, this was a pastel color, but there was like shades of light within that pastel color that made it interesting or you'll notice more shadows versus light and it just helps you one it, it, it kind of sucks because you go through a few roles and then you go like i fucked up that's the honest answer to it but the reality is that you're just kind of like stretching a muscle in a different way and then just trying to figure out what that is i mean um why i mean black and white photography is one of the hardest things i think i admire photographers who can get it right every single time um it is a process that I committed to doing this year. So mm -hmm. it's like 2022 is going to be my year of like, at least getting black and white photography started. Um, and what's been interesting is um, I've fallen short of my uh, New Year's resolution. Uh, I have a black and white account. And if you look at it, last time I uploaded was probably at the beginning of the year. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so what I do is like, I'll always have two cameras on me one of them is loaded black and white and what i'll do is limit myself to like mostly shit on the black and white camera and then try yeah. to and so i guess but do you ever get that like urge or feeling where it's like this is such a great color photo i'll come back to black and white and it's like it's <laughs> yeah. discipline. and that's sort of what i was trying to say at the beginning it always happens to me that i'll go out i'll see a beautiful photo i'll try to get it beautiful to me and i'll remember shit this is black and white sometimes i'll be like happily surprised by the result mm -hmm. other times i'll be like this is a horrible photo like i can't do anything with it um yeah. what i do like about black and white and sort of how i'm approaching the project and how i pivoted is that things that are deeply personal to me mm -hmm. will be in black and white photography so those intimate moments with friends and family or even like you know, at home with my partner and my dog, like those moments will feel more black and white to me. Whereas in my work is in color. And then there's, it helps me divide those two worlds. Like when people, you know, go like, hey, well, you don't upload any personal photos. I feel like my black and white photos are so personal that I don't know if I can share them. I get that. In, in They're like little, aspect, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what's weird, and I don't know if it happens to anybody else that's listening or even yourself, but like, I feel my memories are in black and white. And that's sort of how I'm able to make that connection of like, those are intimate moments that are filled with emotion. So color is actually a distraction. Yeah, I, you know, I can, I can understand that. But like, weirdly, in my father's shoes, and I don't know how to explain that. I think the best way to explain what you just said is that when I was little, my dad has like these old video, like, I don't know what it was. I think it's just an old tape, whatever it was. And like, it was just these photos of him when he was younger and it's all black and white. And when I was little, I was so confused to the point where it's like, did you only see black and white? Did you not have color back then? He's like, no, this is the fucking tape, relax. And I, but, like, <laughs> yeah. but just seeing like his whole like childhood, cause he had, I guess, grandpa Evans, you know, had a lot of tape. He loved shooting. And so like, it was just interesting seeing my father's uh, shoes when he was like my age and stuff all in black and white. So it, it is like this comforting and like, you can really see what was going on. And I don't know, like with black and white, it's a more of, I don't know if it's the right word, but emotional, it creates this, like, you know, yeah, it sets up that North, that North setting. Right. I think like the, the thing about black and white photography is that going back to the earlier point is we have an association immediate to it. Like your grandpa Evans, like, of course, like, as I grew up, like the photos of my grandparents or my great grandparents are either black and white sepia, um, kind of like what hit this Instagram filter kind of piece all the way through kind of like these like ectochrome kind of faded dates. And it's sort of like this transition. And I think we connect those to the days of like, you know, memories and melancholic and nostalgic feelings, but also like, you know, Ansel Adams and like all these like great photographers that we stand on, they were able to capture in great detail, the marvels of the world without the need of color. So their capability of being able to abstract 
what we need color for is an amazing accomplishment as a photographer. Mm -hmm. um, like you can see the details in the grass and the rock in a way that in color, you'd be distracted by the color combination. Yeah. And I think that is admirable. And I think it's sort of like, to us, it might be emotional. To them, it was a level of detail and craftsmanship on both, you know, hauling that large format camera over um, and then the time in the dark room spent on just like getting every detail right. And I think that's sort of what black and white professional photography feels like to me. Um, but then you see street photography and they're doing it in a second without thinking, getting the right shot, like if they were dancing. I, well, I was going to say, because like, yeah, Adams is like, you know, first photographer I've seen, you know, from like learning from my dad and everything. And um, the question I was going to ask was, do you think you can tell the difference of someone who can shoot black and white, they're a professional photographer versus color photography. I feel like it's become oversaturated with everyone trying to grab a film camera nowadays. Yeah. Um, I, I think the first thing is that I, you know, there's a stigma about being a professional photographer. I think the difference between being a professional photographer and a photographer is that you make a living exclusively out of photography. Um, you know, wedding photographer is a professional photographer. Um, you know, photographers work on assignments and exclusively make their living out of documentary and assignment photography. They're professional photographers. Mm -hmm. The only difference is separating anybody with a phone that has a camera, a film camera or a DSLR camera and a professional photographer at the end of the day is their capability of actually having to earn a living through it. Um, which if you were to make a living exclusively of your hobby, trust me, you would start educating yourself well beyond your capabilities of that sort of your bread and butter. That's what will get you food every day on your table. Um, oh, 100%. So, there, so there's a high level of respect there. Yeah, very true. Because like, to sorry to interrupt, to just to hit your point where you're yeah, saying, go ahead. Um, I had Alex Burke on here, but like, I literally had him on Monday, earlier this Monday, and got, thank, shout out to him. Thank you for coming on, Alex. And like, literally what everything you're saying on point, because he was just saying like, or just like at least talking to him, he was, to be honest, he went over my head a little bit with some of the, like the concepts and like techniques he was saying and like, but this yeah. is what he does. This is what, and I, this is what the podcast is about learning, learning new things. And um, yeah, you know, this man, this is what he does for a living. He's a landscape photographer, but it was interesting talking to him I, like as a creative. And I'm just like, so do you like, does someone hire you and you go out and take your photos? And he says, he doesn't even worry about the money. He goes out there, does his shots. And then whatever he, you know, gets or after he takes his photos and everything, then he starts figuring out the money. And I think that was such an interesting like thought process, because at least for me, I like try to get my, you know, clients lined up. What do you need me to do? Let me mix it, master it, whatever. And then, boom. Yeah. but this is like more of a freedom kind of less worrying, I guess, aspect. And that comes with the recognition. I mean, obviously Alex Burke, like, I don't even know where to start, but it comes with the recognition and the master of your art, right? Like once you get to the master of your art, it comes down to the fact of ensuring that your that your body's worth of work is representative of your vision and your 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 statement to the art. Um, I I think my point is is that you know that word photographer has become a little bit of a a very kind of loaded word in the sense that. At times, a community that's supposed to be a very open community has become very gate kept, right? Like in the sense that you can only come into this photographer community if you A, B, C, D. And the reality is that it's never been more accessible in the history of mankind to be a photographer. Mm -hmm. Like anybody with a phone could be a photographer. Yeah. Um, it just depends on your willingness to learn, connect with creatives, and putting your work out there. And I'm sure that in 50 or 30 years from now, we're going to see great work that never saw the day of light, a la Vivian Mayer. And like, it'll just come back to us from people who did not share out into the community. Um, but there were photographers. So, I mean, it is silly to think about it, but I think we're at the stage where everybody can become a photographer. It's whether you put the time, the investment, and the willingness to learn and get it wrong um, to actually put your work out there. Um, whether you put your work out there for your friends or your family, or you put the work out there uh, for the likes and the traction. I don't know. It really, it really depends. Well, I think some of the best work doesn't even get a single like. No, that's, that's, 
so many fucking great points you made, sir. And I love it. It's like, <laughs> like just going back for a second, what you're saying is that I think it's amazing. I think the first thing is like, and this just goes for anything you want to do in life. If you want to do something, you got to put in the time and you have to have failure and make mistakes and not like worry about it. I think like photography, music, art, whatever it is, you got to learn from the mistakes. That's the biggest thing. And I feel like a lot of people are, are afraid to show the mistakes. They only want to show perfect perfection. I get it, but nothing's perfect in this world. You, you all just have to realize nothing's perfect. You just got to learn that and just make the mistake. I'm not perfect. So like, you're not perfect. The whole world's not perfect. So we all just have to first start there and learn from that. And then the second thing you were saying, I think it's crazy how like iPhones or whatever, like they, they're trying to get to the scale level of photography, which like I said, you could really take a great photo with it. And I have, I heard people on here back and forth. Like some people are like, fuck the iPhone, forget it. This camera I have, <laughs> is, you know, this is true photography having this, the iPhone is, but at the end of the day, I think if you could take a you know photo, a photo is a photo. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to you know the parallel back to art, or even you know, you know, carpenters. It's, it's at the end of the day is it's the tool that feels the most comfortable to realizing what you want to do. So, like, if that's a a phone, go for it. If that's a point and shoot, go for it. If that's a six by seven medium format camera, go for it. Or if you can only do your work using large format, please let me follow you. Like the thing here is the, the camera is an instrument and it, it, it's a process, right? It's filled with details from like the purists to say, I never edit my photos, um, which could be a huge error because and, even if and you're that just is getting a, it- That is a myth. I just want to point out, yeah. Alex Burke has pointed in the podcast, went into it. He said, that is a myth because people who develop photos for you, you're already editing it. You know, like they're do already- yeah. the, so the minute you choose your chemicals, you've already effectively modified the results of that of that, you know, roll of celluloid. Like you've made a choice on like, I want that. And, and how many seconds you spend on it or what machine you use or people who exclusively develop and process at a certain film lab mm -hmm. will be very disappointed when they move film labs because they were getting their photos edited for them um, to match a color, one color science specified by either the software, the old Windows PC sitting on top of that scanner, mm -hmm. or even if you go to a more professional lab, they're doing some color correction for you. And then most of those folks will get home and then upload it to social media. Then there's another layer of it just getting compressed by that app. And that app is already making modifications and thoughts on your behalf of like, you know what, in order to be less bits, I'm going to like lower the sharpness or, you know, increase the saturation. And then every screen that your photo is being seen or every way you print it is already modifying the photo one more time. Yeah. So the reality is that your photo has been edited both by the processing, your development, your editing, a third party app. So another application that you just put your work on or a printer and their inks. And then whoever sees it will have a different interpretation based on what they're seeing it through. Even the light in a museum will alter the photo quality of what's on the wall. Um, so the reality is that we're all looking at edited versions. And I think as a photographer, the best thing you can do is try to get closest to your vision's mind or your mind's vision of what that photo looked like when you saw it in your mind. Um, that's your best job. As a photographer, you can only try to get as close as how it felt, whether that was purple skies or blue skies, or you know it was actor color or portrait color. There's no right way of getting to it. Yeah. Although every decision will modify your result, that's for sure. But it's a myth. It's, it's a myth that nobody edits their photo because either you're getting it edited or everybody's viewing it differently. hundred percent. I just want to make that clear to anyone who listened to Alec Burke in this podcast that you it's already edited. So you purists, you need to all be quiet, you old heads out there. By the way, there's nothing wrong in being a purist. So let me also kind of like, I'm not trying to appease everyone. Uh, no, I edit my photos. Uh, even if you like crop or rotate or you like, like you're doing a modification to your photo, but like, even if you're a purist, the way that you've selected your ingredients is the way that you like your work to be. And then that is the way that you've defined your work to work. Like I can only develop in this lab. I can only let them use these chemicals. Like 
you're being a purist in the way that you've streamlined your work to a specific way, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's inherently been edited. Like there is absolutely nothing you can say about, there is no pure Kodak look. I don't even think Kodak, and I might be wrong and somebody might correct me, can say, Portra has some latitudes, but I don't think they could get you to color match every single time. Yeah, I think, I think, well, I think the, the main, well, we'll find out in the comments. We'll see what happened. But, <laughs> but this is the day I got burned. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully not. But what you're saying, I think even like the purists, like choosing this, this, and this, you have a, you know, a sharp idea what you want. But like you said, it's still getting edited at the end of the day. To be a purist at that point, it's like, don't even get your film edited. Don't even get it like developed. Just take the photo and that's it. <laughs> if you want. And, and, and they've been very lucky to find like the one source to get the look they want. Like they found the combination of everything. They found the film stock they like, the lab they like, the processing and the scanning. They found the workflow that works for them. Other folks that are in constant look for editing and innovating or changing stocks are folks who haven't found their one toolkit yet. Or there's people like myself who part of the love of the film photography is part of the experimentation process. For me, like putting on a role that I have no clue what could happen is part of the magic and sometimes a huge driver of the letdown. Um, like, and I have opinions, for example, I'm one of those, like, I like Ektar fields, mm -hmm. but I know the minute I put that out into the world, people go like, how dare you like Ektar? And it's because in one of my, you know, one of my photo walks like Hector just worked for me every single shot well um, I, I can't believe there's like I mean I understand it like in the music aspect like if you're an artist you stick with one genre but then you have those artists who's trying to like go to a try a different genre and their main fans are like what the fuck are you doing <laughs> like I, I get yeah. that aspect and it's like but I didn't know like people like if you're follow base um they would get so mad just experimenting because experiment you have to experiment to learn new things and like try stuff that's the whole point i think it's great and even if you're a film photographer you know it's okay to you venture into digital as well or and vice versa like the whole thing is finding the right hammer for the work like if and sometimes it's a hammer you can find like at the end of the day it's like if it's your phone and you got a beautiful photo out of that, are you just not gonna share it because of what you shot it through? Um, the reality is, and, and I think you might've asked this question, it's like with a black, white and, and color photographer, if a color photographer, you can tell when they shoot black and white or black and white will know when they're shooting color. It will always have your signature. That's part of like why people follow somebody. It's because they like something about the way that they view the world through their eyes. I find that one of the most amazing things. Every time you follow somebody and you're in love through their vision, it's because you're in love with the way that they are seeing the world. Oh, yeah. You're connecting to that somehow. It's like, oh, I love your reds or I love your blues or I love the way that you compose the photo all the way to like geek, like actual like camera gear geeks that are like, oh, my God, I love that Sumicron look. And it's just like, it's all valid. Like. Oh yeah, it's insane that different things connect people to the same photo. That that is a psychological experiment. You're like creating mixed motions for me, emotions for me, because I feel that <laughs> like, like for like, but in a good way. Like like like, I kind of can relate because like with photography. I mean, I know I understand it to like an as like to a basic aspect. But when you're saying this to me, the first thing that comes to me is music. Like that's just like of the artists who I truly appreciate or like composers or pianist or jazz, or whatever, like I can see that because that that's what you want to take your creation. And I think, but then I guess to a point to that, it's like, you admire that artist, photography, musician, whatever, to the point, is it not copying, but doing the same exact thing they're, they're doing? Like, where is the fine line of where you're not fully just taking what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, that's the whole idea back at like a couple minutes back about the idea of a remix. Like, yeah, you know, when is it a sample and when is it a straight out copy? Yeah. Um, I think the idea of being inspired and kind of, and, and I, 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 this is like a, a, a way of encompassing that concept. It's you're calibrating yourself against somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to calibrate yourself with somebody that you admire. Um, this YouTuber called Frederick. I'm gonna butcher his last name. 
Uh, but he does these YouTube series about how to shoot like fill in the black, right? Mm-hmm. Like Vivian Meyer, like, you know, Ansel Adams. And, and he kind of like uses his own setup, but he emulates the photography of that one set photographer. And what he gets to is, you know, no matter how much you try to copy somebody's style, something about you is going to come through. It's going to like shimmer through. Um, whether it's, you know, the way that you do the light setup or the way that you focus on certain details that maybe the original photographer wouldn't be. I think it's okay to copy for learning purposes. I mean, that's how we learn how to write. That's how we learn how to play music. You don't start by composing your own music. You start by playing other people's music, mm-hmm. learning what they did, the progression, the chords and everything, the structure. And, and then from there, you kind of build a base of knowledge. So I think as long as you're copying for the purpose of calibration and education, it's a very valid exercise. It's even valid to share it. Mm-hmm. If anything, it's your way of acknowledging an inspiration or, or one of the people who inspire you. Um, but you do need to build on their base. Like you need to step on the shoulders and go further. Um, not for the purpose of us as like people who are like actually watching the art. It's more for your your achievement in the art. It's for you to put something out there that will stand the test of time. Um, whether it's, you know, the prints that, you know, Grandpa Evans did all the way through, like, hopefully, like, you know, we post all this stuff on social media, but hopefully people are doing physical prints and leaving some work behind for people to see them years after. Because I can tell you, these platforms might not stick around for longer than human civilization. That's, well, I mean, that's, that's a whole other topic. We, I mean, I would love <laughs> for sure about the platforms but i that's the reason why i started because i found my grandparents uh, scrapbooks and seen them when they were young and then like i mean not shout out to covid but also covid you're the only reason why i got to look at these scrapbooks because i was at home but like not giving a shout out to it but like saw the scrapbooks saw my grandfather when he was young when he went to you know raf when he was in the british air force and all the stuff and um i was like shit this is this is so cool and saw my mom and everything on that side. And I think it was like, I want to, like you said, leave a legacy or something, something for your kids or grandkids or whatever to see, well, this is what Sebastian was doing in 2022 and stuff like that, or what Grant Evans was doing or any of it. I think it's, yeah, it's like a, it's like an artifact, like vinyl. It's in your physical hands and it's always there, you know? And I think that's something meaningful. Yeah. And, and I think that's, I mean, it was amazing to see, once again, not, not shouting out a world pandemic, but it was interesting to see yeah. people picking up cameras and documenting a historical moment through their own eyes and how it affected them. Some people had their best creative moments trying to figure and puzzle out what they can do. Some people you know, suffered and had to figure out how, you know, we talked about professional photographers, they were the most badly hurt mm-hmm. um, because they weren't able to work from home. And the ones who did figure it out, those are the people we should admire, the folks that like figured out how to like make photography at home. Um, but I have never seen so many people pick up film photography through COVID. Um, and it was interesting because it is sort of like, you know, when you have an excess of time, you're delaying the gratification of the results. Mm. Yeah. So I, I guess it just had to do with like, Hell, I got time to wait for my scans to come back. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, definitely, I agree. Um, it's funny you mentioned it. The way I got into photography was also my dad. Nice. Um, I mean, I picked up his camera growing up, and he'd always take it back and be like, you can't use that. That's like for grownups only. And then he developed the role, and there'd be like four or five photos I was able to sneak in there. Nice. And that would be like my slow like introduction to it. And then... When I went back home and um, got married right before the pandemic, uh, my dad was like, here, take, take my camera, it's yours now. And it just clicked for me. I was like, I was like heavy into like Fujifilm photography and digital photography and mobile photography. And then suddenly like everything slowed down. And I was like, I need to figure out this machine. Mm. And that's what um, I love about it, how like, like you said, the slow down, because like with digital, you can take it and see it. And, you know, if you don't like it, it's there. You could just redo it, photography or film, I should say. You kind of have to, I mean, yeah, you could just take the photo and then get it developed and just take more film, but that's going to be pricey. So I think, you know, at least in my aspect, I mean, go ahead. It, it isn't getting cheaper. Yeah. Um, I'm more patient with the film. <laughs> yeah, you're definitely not burning through them. 
Um, but it, it is, I mean, at the beginning, and I, I don't know if, if you can resonate with this, but like at the beginning when you start shooting film, you're just burning through those worlds because your mindset's changing from taking my time from, sorry, from, you know, taking a thousand photos of that one sunset to like, you know, I should probably not take more than two of the sunset just in case, you know, I run out. Like it takes a while at adapting at the new craft. It's like, if I told you you're recording on tape, you're yeah. going to be way more conscious of when you press record. Oh, um, believe me, I have, I have a tape machine. So I, uh, <laughs> you're the real, so I definitely. <laughs> yeah. So I think it just goes back to that. It goes back to, uh, you know, we all pass through a transition. What's great about the film community, I think it's, and, and this is true to photography, um, which I think it's kind of unique compared to other arts is that, except maybe for music. And even then I think there's a differentiation on it's the community aspect to it. It's the fact that you're actually willing to sit down with somebody you barely know to give them, you know, how the, the film 101, how to load the film, how to expose, how to use your camera. And like, I've never seen anybody saying like, no, I won't help you. Yeah, that's a huge, and I, I, I mentioned this before and with some other uh, episodes of the podcast, but just seeing, you know, the music community and the film community, like shout out to you guys. I love you all because like you, you guys in the film are just very, you know, genuine and like, I don't know, maybe this is something like the most of the, except for Alex, everyone who I've been on here has just been like a hobby, you know, like this is what you do, but you're willing to help. And you guys are amazing photos, everyone. And, but with music, the people I know, they, they don't tell anyone anything because it's so, I mean, anything you do created creative, it's going to be, you know, and if you're trying to do this as a business, you know, make money, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. And if music, everyone's ruthless and no one wants to give the secrets, how you get that snare nice and uh, warm and like, you know, fat yeah. or, you know, how you, uh, how do you play that, you know, jazz chord so quickly or like moving from, you know, chord to chord or whatever it is, like, unless you're like really close to that person or you go to school for it and no one's going to tell you the secrets and even then university of arizona they didn't really gave me the secret i had to like <laughs> like rip it out of them some of my professors to tell me how did you play this motif or whatever so yeah and you know what's interesting is that music is a more collaborative art whereas in photography it's an individual art um yeah. however the approach of getting that result is way more collaborative from like and this dates back to like the forum days, like no matter like, and I'm sure you've done this. If you like look for a camera that you might have or a camera that you're considering, you'll find forums from like the early 2000s or like and of people like talking about their cameras. And as we transitioned to digital, that community kind of stuck around. Um, and, you know, I, I, I tend to see photo walks across corners, across different places in the world. I've been like, I was in Mexico a couple of months ago and there was like a group of people walking together were just photographing and it was like I could identify with what they're doing the amazing feel of doing that on a Saturday morning um as as much as I would be in San Francisco or any other city in the world like there is this sense of community that I feel like as soon as you get to a new place like you need to find your click and for photographers it's way easier mm -hmm. um no matter your digital or film I think like there is there, there is no differentiation on that but I will, I will give out the shout out to the film community, of, specifically of the Bay Area. It's one of the coolest, you know, film communities that I've had the chance to even talk to. Yeah, I mean, so far, uh, you all have just been great and very open and heartwarming and just, um, just like even even giving me places to eat, like recommend recommending to me. I just <laughs> like love it. You know, it's just like it's so great, and you build a connection and. There was something that Toby was saying on the, the one I did with him to a point where he was saying, like, if he'd stopped film or anything, he would still talk to the people in the community because he appreciates the friendship either way. Yeah. Like, and I think you build I mean, these close connections with people. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I'm not originally from even the United States. Um, and what's interesting is that I didn't find my click until like I got to meet these folks around like the Bay Area who are film photographers. And then I felt I was at home. Prior to that, I still very much felt like going through the motions of like, I am uh, a foreigner and I'm kind of getting my foot. The minute I found somebody who I could geek out about cameras and photography and 
like they would share like their favorite like beers and like their favorite restaurants like it just feels like you click i mean and to toby's point shout out to him mm -hmm. which is how i found your podcast yeah well um, yeah honestly shout out to him and shout out to you <laughs> uh, is these are the same group of people that even if like film is stopped being produced tomorrow and i hope it isn't i would still talk to these same humans is because now I understand them beyond the camera stuff. It's like, I know what they like to do. I know the name of their pets. Like you just start kind of like clicking in and kind of like finding that piece. And I think that's what's so personal about photography. Whereas in music, where like we actually get to see the life of the people that we follow. And we kind of get to see, you know, like Alex Soth is one of my favorite photographers. Um, if you can get him on, kudos to you. But um he he basically you know is able to give you a preview of what he's living and you know how he's he has his youtube series which is insane to anybody who hasn't watched it where he just picks up his favorite photo books and walks you through them and how they inspired him um and so you're looking at what he's doing on a friday night i imagine him like a you know a cold beer just like looking at these photos on the table of his house or on the couch or on i don't know i imagine it very casual um, or even people like Joel Mayerwitz, which in saying that he's still on Instagram, shooting everyday photos and you're going like, holy crap, this guy's Joel Mayerwitz. And like, he is the legend of color. And I can see him taking a photo of just his grass and his yard and like, that's fine. I feel like you get to see the human behind and you start falling for that human versus the work. And I think that's sort of interesting. So all that to say is that the community is filled with amazing people who teach you way more about humanity than photography to, to, to put it shortly. Well, I, I, I mean, well said and so many points again to that, because like, yeah, psychologically, it's interesting how, you know, you see someone's work, you love it, but then you start having this relationship with this, you can call it idol or mentor or inspiration, whatever to this person, like you said, like, and it, it's crazy how you just start following them and everything they do. And it goes surpass photography. You just want to know what's going on. Like, and at that point, it's like, why does the mind go there? Why, like, why do we start like loving this person even more, you know, even more than the work? Cause I get that for sure. I like, I can understand that. Um, again, yeah. with, take, take George Harrison, love him love him he got me into the reason why i play it so fun fact i played the sitar the reason why i played because he got me into it and then ravi shankar so it's like you yeah. know it's like but i love i follow like the daily george on instagram to know like you know just like whatever but it's uh it's why do you go there i don't know it's interesting and, and, and the fact that you get to meet these folks that you admire personally does not underplay your admiration mm-hmm if anything, you're closer to the source. You're just able to kind of drink the Kool-Aid. And what's interesting in all these like photography walks and all these like local meetups, and by the way, whether they're happening in New York City, San Francisco, they're happening in Sao Paulo, they're happening in London, like it doesn't matter. It's a fact that somebody is willing to walk physically and educationally through the way that they get a photo. Like it's interesting going out with like these big, you know, great photographers and they'll just tell you like what they're seeing, how they're framing it, how they're thinking about the edit all in front of you. And they're not hiding it from you. They're not like, you know, you got to pay my course and take a photography course through it. Like they're just telling you in the field what they're doing. Oh yeah. It's like, take, so take out, uh, take Drew Evans, shout out to him. Like I, I shot with him, maybe I've gone with him twice and just telling him, you know, was trying to get some photos, maybe, someone shooting with my camera to use it for an album cover or something. I was like, and he, you know, love how he, you know, he, sh you know, scans and develops his photos. And I was like, would you do it? I would pay. And he's like, no, I'll do it for free. Like I got you. And I was like, like, like you say, you don't have to pay anything. Like he's just the homie shout out to drew first film photographer. Actually, no, Jaime was the first one. He was the second one. No, he was the third one. Sorry. Forgot about Kim. Uh, but he was just so down to earth and just like, you know, willing to help me out or do that. Or even just like watching him shoot, like he inspired me just to understand how I should start thinking what I should be looking for, you know, giving me little tips here. And I was like, to me, that means a lot. Yeah. And if anything, yeah, shout out to Drew. Um, I think 
the one thing is that it's a community that wants you to stay in it. Yeah. Like, you know, I think to a certain degree, we're all kind of shell shocked, but please don't leave. We need people to keep on being part of this community. We want it to live through. Um, it's also true to the point, like we need this community to thrive for us to not be sitting on a bunch of like, you know, overpriced gear. But at the end of the day, it's, it's that sense of like camaraderie of the, of the sense of like, you know, I remember the first time somebody told me, it's like, Hey, would you mind developing the film? And like, I'll pay you for it. And I was like, uh, are you sure you trust me enough to do it? Even like, like you're putting somebody's memories on your hands. You're like, good luck on me not screwing this one up. Um, and, and I think it's an honor for somebody to trust you that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's funny, Toby and I used to do these like Instagram lives where it was just an excuse for us to drink beer through the pandemic uh, <laughs> at a socially acceptable distance, you know, one in Marin, one in San Francisco, but we would go as far as like showing our edits and our curves and like showing people like the before and afters just because we wanted to debunk the myth of like, we, A, we edit the photos and B, here is the before and after. And this is sort of how I moved the sliders around to make it sense. Um, yeah. Hell, if anybody were to copy paste that, I feel honored that somebody thought it was good enough to be like copied. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, with that, like, I think, first of all, that's great that, you know, you, Toby, and other people who I've seen who have shown their work in like the, like the start to the finish process, I think kudos to you because that means a lot for a lot of people, even me, just because even when, even when you're trying to start out and trying to understand how all this works, I'm confused. Too many people are saying this and that fine whatever like that's great and i only know like shout out to Dayglo. i don't know if you know he's an artist on great indie artist um on youtube he does his start to finish and shows his whole track shows everything shows the core progression how he makes it no one not even i would i mean i should i but like we'll show the kind of like a uh, song exploder yeah lit he does it for every song on every album he breaks down everything and shows even the plug-in or for people who don't know what a plug-in or VST, it's like the software um, yeah. to make for sounds and stuff or EQs. And a it, negative lab pro to your music. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. I needed that. Uh, and it's like, oh my God, he's just breaking it. And this is great. And a lot of people see in the comments, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I Your music inspires me. And then people send links to like, here's a song, but it was inspired from your song, Dayglow. And it's like, that's what we need more of. We need more people to show those doors and not stay behind the curtain because, you know, it's, you get overwhelming or you, you lose, you doubt yourself a lot. I feel if you don't understand. Yeah. That. No, no, I, I fully understand it. I think, you know, back to the thing of like, you know, what makes, and I think this is kind of person and it depends on your personality types too, because a lot of times you can be very open to meeting with these folks. And other times, you know, those situations, specifically during a pandemic, weren't the most friendly to kind of like, you know, go physically meet and share information. Like that was actually what every health expert was telling us, don't do that. Um, but it, it's funny we overcame it. And like, you know, I think that's where, you know, those were the kind of the brighter sides of the social of like people putting out their work and getting those lifetime reaction. Um, I, I think those people that do not share their work, it's not because they don't want to, it's just because it's just not wired into the way that they think about what they're doing. I don't think they're trying to protect the Holy Grail. I think what they're doing is mostly just unaware about the possibility. I, I try to err on people not trying to, you know, wanting to gatekeep that. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I, I believe it in the film or photography land, the music land. I don't know because so many people I see DM people in their life or not DM the comments and like, show me your work. And like, they just like it. Yeah. I, music, I mean, it's, a, it's a different feel. It, they get weird in there with some of the artists or producers a little. Yeah, I'm not even going to pretend to know, but I'm, I'm assuming there's way more uh, copyright um, infringements in that world than photography. I think. 100%. You're creating something from thin air, right? Um, in photography, most times you're trying to capture other other elements that are not yours per se. Um, yeah. So I mean, anybody could anybody could photograph what I photograph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we just come at it from different angles, and the question is, what what is? 
I don't think anybody is owner of anything. Like if somebody took a photo of like Mount Tama Pies, shout out to Toby, who by the way has mastered that. Okay. Is it's mostly about, you know, it's about being able to document something as you know, you saw it. And um, some people are very good at it. I have not been able to get my Mount Tama Pies right, except maybe once. Um, and then there's people that, you know, to your Golden Gate Bridge piece. I like, I've never been able to get a Golden Gate photo that I go like, hell yeah. But I see other people doing it all the time. I'm like, even if it's a postcard photo, it's a darn hard postcard photo to get right. Yeah. 100%. To invoke that feeling, right? Like maybe you can get it from Baker Beach. Maybe you can get it across like, but getting the right Golden Gate Bridge photo, the postcard quality. Yeah. Those postcard photographers knew exactly what they were doing. Um, yeah. 100%. Yeah. 100 percent you speak facts my friend you you're on the ball so yeah i think it's it's interesting and i think to a point you uh you said like earlier is that you find some people you know on instagram who shoot amazing photos but they like they don't get you could say the likes they deserve or like at least recognition like you know like they've been shooting forever but like figuring out the algorithms or promoting it wise, they just aren't there. And it's, it's interesting, you know, cause I've met some people on Instagram, maybe who have 300, maybe 50 like followers or whatever, but they have like their photos inspire me so much. And it, it's crazy, you know, how social media, the, depending on the likes or, you know, hashtags or whatever it is you use, that's how you, you know, get out there it's all interesting how it works and i think it's also about sharing forward i think there's these specific day like there's this really beautiful trend going on where like people with more following or even people with not that much following are curating these guides of like amazing photography of both very well-known photographers to you know a couple of like 10 or 20 people who follow them and i think the ability of being as a community shining the light that you have to somebody else is a great way of paying it forward um, and, and even a way to kind of get rid of systematic issues. So I, I, I'm, I don't know if you've had her or you're considering, but Dan, uh, Danielle from Girls With Too Many Cameras mm. um, does this amazing thing that she started a couple, of, I think more than a year ago now, where every Wednesday it's, you know, Woman Wednesdays and they just curate Woman With, woman with Film Wednesdays, I think it is. And she curates one photographer, uh, female photographer, and just like shines a light at them. And, and, and that helps kind of equalize, you know, our perception of photography. Like once again, to be a full rounded photographer, you need to see the world throughout as many possible eyes as possible. Um, Cause if not, you're kind of like echo chambering yourself into like, you know, if you only shoot San Francisco, you think that is what the world might be. Um, yeah, well, shout and, out. and that's not true. Yeah, well, shout out. Uh, say, what was her username or name? Who does that again? Girl with too many cameras, because that's the truth. She has a big camera collection, and she has a uh, woman with film Wednesdays, I believe it is. And every Wednesday, clockwork, she posts amazing work. Love that. Um, yeah, and and that's amazing. And, and and once again, I think a lot of it is like. Your, your, for your work to be seen is also for you to be seen. Mm -hmm. There is a correlation to that, right? Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, the more we shine light on other people's work, it kind of helps, you know, for those people to feel validated. I mean, I'm sure it happens to you. Like when you put music out there, you want that music to be heard. Yeah, it, it, it's great when like, you know, if you're on blogs or whatever, I think the best feeling, like take an example, long time ago i want to say 2018 um i dropped a song a long time ago with another artist it was called medicine and i got this like twitter thing or a dm because it was open to someone which is saying to me like your song like made me feel so much better to a point where i felt alone and i didn't want to live anymore and it was just kind of wide opening like my song i don't know if he was gonna hurt himself or what but like to tell me that i, I just some song i wrote made you feel a way that you didn't feel left alone and like you're gonna still breathe it's like the best feeling ever I, because I don't want to say I saved a life or anything I just like I just I connected with someone and it feels great and I'm I hope that person's doing great still and thriving and I think it's yeah amazing how 
you like you were going back like how a photo can make you feel like with music it's crazy how a song can make you feel a certain way or take a certain memory or something a situation in your life and relate it into your own and it's it's beautiful and so yeah yeah and, and it's part of like you know putting your work out there is exposing yourself fully like you're putting a piece of you out there that you might have otherwise never done before. Um, and, and you are putting yourself out there. And the fact that somebody connects with you is is great. It's, you know, it's to be seen, it's to feel connected. It's understanding that, you know, other people find the same things that you find as beautiful or as interesting or as unique. Um, you know, <laughs> somehow we were gonna end up in this conversation, but it, it doesn't have to do with an algorithm. It has to do with the people who support you. Um, and shout out to Chris Technicolor Poop um, on his Instagram. I don't know if you follow him, but he put out this great story a couple of days ago or yesterday, I think, where he said, it's not about the algorithm. It's about the people who support you and push you forward. It's about this idea that if you're putting out work there and nobody's liking it or commenting on it, it's not your work that's bad. It's the group that's supporting you that might not be the right click. And eventually you'll find that group of people who will resonate with your work. But you shouldn't be hung up on the algorithm. It's not working for me. Yeah. You shouldn't go like, oh, I shouldn't have posted that photo because it didn't work. It all comes down to like, it just didn't click with who you thought it clicked or what you thought it was going to click with. It's a smaller subset of group of people that are actually fully behind you. As long as those people are not mom and dad. And by the way, mom and dad, big shout out. But like, you know, it's about like just finding that click and, you know, standing behind it and not changing your ways of being. Because if you use likes as an algorithm to optimize your work and I'll, I'll transfer this to music it's like if you optimize your music to actually get into spotify playlists yeah. you're optimizing it to work on a platform not based on your work but based on what the platform has defined for you so like you shouldn't accommodate that to likes or you know hit your your course in 30 seconds like yeah you should really let it like drip and be a document of your work no, a hundred percent like preach, preach, please. Because another person, shout out to Maxwell's, he's an artist. Um, but he was saying, I remember saw like on his Instagram about like literally what you're saying, like it's not the algorithm, it's not this, it's you'll find the right fan base for you. You just but stay true to yourself. Don't like um, and it's hard believe me it's hard to like not do what the industry standards have your two minute and 30 second song and have it whatever about this specific topic that can relate to everyone and yeah. these chord progressions and whatever do what you want to do like me I love getting complex with the harmonies and the voicings in my music you know really take Bill Evans who's shout out to him amazing jazz pianist um, not yeah. related at all you know that would be cool if you were <laughs> just throwing that out there but uh i love what he does and i love like how sometimes his songs maybe can go to five to seven minutes and it's like like that's what i want to do but i realize some of the people who listen to my music want my three minute max music and it's it's like yeah but at the same time i got i started doing this because for me for me to help myself express myself because sometimes my words aren't there but my hands are so it's yeah a, i mean there there there's never been a better time to be a creator, like shorts, full stop. Like mm -hmm. the fact that sometimes you need to put it into proportions, but like, if you get 20 likes, it's the way of thinking about like, there are 20 people who stood in front of your photo, stopped, double tapped and took it in. If you were in an art gallery and there were 20 people around a single photo, that would blow your mind. Yeah. And if you think about people who have, 300 or 400 likes like those were 400 people in a gallery looking at a single photo not even the mona lisa gets that amount of love in a second and if you like take that to people who have 100 or like 10,000 100,000 or even a million followers they can fill multiple stadiums to look at a single photo like when you put that into proportions of actual human beings sitting in, in actual square footage mm -hmm. your mind is blown with like 20 is a hell of a lot of like love yeah uh, and and even if it's five it's five people who stopped and took your photo in um so sometimes it's also putting that number into perspective is if like if one of your songs maybe made it to like 500 or a thousand streams you might be like ah you know i'm still like under a thousand on the spotify counter 
but that's a thousand people who listen to your song. If you were like pulling out tapes or you know, CDs way back pre-internet days, like uh, you'd be super happy with a thousand people who just listen to your music. A hundred percent. And like, even if like, and also keep in mind, like that one person listening to your music could have other people around you, you know, just for like to other people to realize. And then they yeah. get hooked on and it just like goes crazy. Or you have one photo and someone says, look at this photo or they, you know, dm the photo to someone else like showing like isn't this photo amazing or whatever or posting it on their story which a lot of people do you know posting another photographer's posts you know what is what is crazy and i don't know why instagram doesn't open this to more people and it's just like part of a creator account which anybody couldn't have but you know if you do have a creator account which once again is open to anybody who declares they're a creator is that you can look at your insights and insights have like specific metrics like you know, how many people did you reach and how many people reacted? Did they arrive there for hashtags or did they arrive there by like whatever it might be? But one of the cool metrics that it has is saves. Every time you hit that little flag towards the right of a photo, and sometimes you're like, people have saved that photo and like have put it on a special place, like their own Pinterest board of like photos of something. And then next to that is how many people have actually shared it and passed it on. Yeah those numbers matter way more because even if one person saved it that's like if one person hung it at their house oh yeah oh yeah and you can even see who saves it right i'm pretty sure there's a place where like right they can like say like uh, I, I know who you can see who reshared your story or who shared your post as a story okay if if you can see who saved it that'd be amazing because sometimes like i'll post like a photo of like i don't know my partner and i'm like who are these four people who thought this was an interesting thing it's like I hope it's my mother-in-law and my parents. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean. But hope, I mean. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it all comes down to scale and recognition, right? Like if you understand scale, you'll feel better about it. I think it's, you know, going back to like the initial one of the first things we spoke about, which is it's not the comparison. It's the building on yourself. It's like, don't compare yourself to people who get like thousands of likes. That's the wrong idea. Mm -hmm. compare yourself to you a month ago or two months ago and you'll notice that there's an incremental value to that i sound like a coach at this stage which by the way i am not well you know i think this is great because you're inspiring you're inspiring me you're I, to everyone out there i think they're being inspired because i think it's important to hear this because i think i don't know where the saying came from but like you get lost in the sauce and like you know it's uh you get into the likes and all this and it's like you can't forget why you got into this passion what was the main reason and, and it's always good to take a step back and breathe and remember what you're and we'll doing. all go yeah and we'll all go through like lows i mean in any art you'll go through a low a minute oh, yeah. you're feeling uninspired unmotivated sometimes you just can't get out of bed and that's fine because you're going to get through it if anything your best work might be in front of you mm. um and I think it might have been, once again, you're the, the one podcast I got to hear from yours is the one that Toby that got me into this was Toby said that his metric to success or what got him that much, you know, impact was his sticking to posting every day. It was that whole, like, every day I'll just post. Um, and that, that works for people who are willing to put themselves out there every day. It's sort of like, if you want to be, uh, this is definitely out of my field of expertise, but if you want to be like a bodybuilder, if you don't get into the gym every day, you ain't going anywhere. Yeah, uh, no, I think, and that's like, cause I like, I try to post every day at least or something, you know, for film or for photos, but yeah. And I'm okay taking that chance, but weird, like, like you're saying this, like psychologically for music and maybe it's because like different teachers at my school have told me different things. Like, I haven't posted anything maybe since 2020 or something just because, well, first of all, I'm learning right now. I'm in school, but I have stuff, but I don't want to drop it until it's like I get into this weird psychological. It has to be perfect. But no, like, again, not, you, you try to make it so perfect, but like it's never going to be perfect. One teacher says you just got to release it. You know what I mean? And you keep learning from each thing. Another teacher has told me work on it keep on until it's at its best and it's like it should be the same thing a few artist friends who i know are dropping a song every month that is their goal drop one song a month to keep like you know building that connection yeah but and 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 by the way like you can do that without exposing it out to the world right i mean like for example there's this um he's a brazilian photographer his name is cecinha so c-e-s-i-n-h-a 
Um, he's a content creator based out of Sao Paulo. And he, he does this exercise where like, it's just like push yourself to take as many photos as you can in your house and then look at them in a few days and just kind of see what you created. You, you could have the most interesting photos sitting in your desk right now and you just don't realize it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and forcing yourself to like, just use that muscle. It's the equivalent of walking. It's the same thing with music. Even if you're not putting work out there, you must pick up your guitar or you must pick up a piano and like fiddle a few chords. I don't know if that made me sound like an 80 year old, but like. No, you're there. <laughs> I, do it. I do it. I have one right. I have a guitar right next to me. So continue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you just like, you know, even if you play like for a minute or two, like you, you, you put it in, you put in that, you know, those miles in. Um, yeah. And, and I think, you know, what we're lucky to see is people actually share those small little moments um, now. Like, look, I took this photo of like a vase that the right the light hit just right. And like, I was sitting in my couch and that looked beautiful for some odd reason. And that's fine. Um, you might not print it in the museum, but hell, you know, it, it does make for like a, a good exercise of light. Yeah. Like, you know, like take a, it's like a muscle memory, at least like when you're saying the guitar, you, you're at least getting those fingers, you know, stretched out and played. Yeah. And like for photography, maybe you're just like figuring out, like you get it back. Oh, I kind of like this angle. Maybe we could try with something else with similar shape or something. And I think it's always good to, you know, you got to experiment going back. It, it's one of the, one of the folks that actually kind of inspired me beyond like, you know, the Alex Burks or, you know, the Kyle McDougall's of the world, like um, Willem Burby, you know, um, who I think anybody at the stage has passed through his YouTube channel um, has seen the impact he has had in the community said something along the lines of like his last video he uploaded was just him in his house taking photos. And he said that was one of the most beautiful things he's ever done. And it was literally him in his house. And think about the places this guy, this guy went, this guy went to Svalbard to like shoot, you know, 24 hours of, of nighttime. And he said shooting around his house was one of the most, you know, gratifying creative exercises he's done. Uh, and I, and immediately he took me back to the artist who like would grab their like basket of, fruit, open their canvas and just paint that bowl of fruit, like over time, decaying over time or people who sketch it all the time. Like it is just that exercise of like, you know, like you can do this. It's, it's pretty cool that you can do photography anywhere. Like you don't need to like drive miles. You can like literally do it anywhere. No. Yeah. I think it's, it's like, you got to be, you got to realize, you know, you don't have to do, you don't have to go here or there, or even take this. You don't need a certain camera, you know, you don't need this or that, you know, unless like there's meaning to it. Like, don't get like people like, don't, I'm not shitting on Leica. I have a Leica, so I'm not, shooting, <laughs> I'm not going there, but I'm just saying, you don't like, you know what I mean? Um, if, I mean, gear, gear is important. Going back, it's your hammer, right? And like, you have to be comfortable with your hammer. And some people like, there is some science to gear. Like we do not have to say like, oh, it doesn't matter what gear you should. It does matter. Um, it just might not matter where you think it matters, right? Like right. a camera is essentially a black box, light sealed, so no light comes in as it exposes your film. But things like a lens do matter. The lens is yeah. sort of your eye sight equivalent. So like how it's coated and you know how wide or close can it open and close or like, how much light can it let in or like all those things or the leaf shutter is not a leaf shutter like all those things do matter because it is through that that you're seeing the world um so you know i, I would even go suggest of like you know like is a great example i'm also you know i also have a leica and and, and and i feel blessed to have the luck of having to be able to own one mm. um but i'm more in, interested in the leica lens than i am on the leica body exactly because but yeah. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I, go ahead. I mean, the way, like, if, if you've ever put a 35 Sumicron, look at me talking about what I just uh, shit on a couple minutes ago. <laughs> but like, if you grab a 35 Sumicron and a 35 Canon, and by the way, Canon have beautiful lenses. I'm a big fan of the FD series, the L series and the EF lenses. I can geek out on that. But like, they are significantly like different. Like this is a Canon 35 and this is like the Sumicron and it's just tiny. They're like, the German engineers have put it down to the exact science of like very small portable lenses that generate beautiful colors and lights and shadows. And like, they figured it out. They, they, they figured it out because they put in the hours 
to figure out what that is and they charge you for that uh, because they hand make them. Um, but so yeah, like gear does matter as in references to the lens. And I think large format photography is the best example of this. Uh, if you're familiar with large format, it's like, it's basically a bevel and pieces of wood. Like my, my idealized version of a large format camera with a piece of ground glass on the other side. And the only thing that really matters in that equation, besides not messing it up, is what lens you've got on it. Yeah, I totally, I mean, Alex, Alex Burke was telling me about like the lenses he was using and how he has to set up and it's, uh, he's just saying, yeah, it's about the lens and how, like how sharp it is and what he's, what he's trying to capture. And I was like, yeah, at the end of the day, like your body doesn't matter as long as that, sh you know, your lens is the money maker, you know, unless you can get yeah. an adapter to like those lenses or something, but yeah. And you can do that. You can, you can buy like a glass and there's, you know, like budget friendly approaches to the rangefinder. You can buy anything from a Konica to a Nikon size to like, you know, Bessa, like there is like a subset. And even like, if you're into the M mount, Voilander makes beautiful classic lenses that generate like, like a color. Um, and actually even with more character than Leica, um, some people get way better results with the Voilanders than they do with the Leica. And that's just like, how they found their great combination of like their lens and their photo style to get that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the thing here is that you just have to find the lens that works for you. Like, you know, I've, I've got my dad's camera here and like what honestly more than and it's a Canon A1, this is mostly what I shoot most of my work on, even having the M6 on the side. And it's this Canon FD 51.4 that always does it for me. Nice. Um, and it's a $50 lens and it just works for me. Um, but yeah, that's a money maker. And you know what sucks about it? And, and I don't know if Alex spoke about it. Once you find your quote, quote, money maker, um, you're scared shitless that one day it's going to break and not work. So sure, like, I oh, need yeah. to redundant have amounts of the same lens. Yeah, he definitely mentioned that he has like a ton of them. And just like, he always has like a backpack or like a satchel or something with them so if one doesn't if one breaks you got another one to you know put on I'm yeah like, yeah literally yeah my i mean it, it's like finding that right balance of things i think what makes like a so beautiful it's just they're made with so much attention to detail it's like it's like you don't need a premium camera you don't need a premium pen you don't need a premium anything to do your art mm -hmm. but if it makes you feel comfortable and it inspires you to pick it up more it's done its job like it's been paid off mm-hmm yeah. And, you know, your, your future children and grandchildren will thank you for making that investment one day. Yeah, I'm passing it down, like, for, for real. I found out. Um, so I, or I, it can also be great. Like, I suck at investing. Uh, but if that camera can one day get me out of a very tough situation, you know, that's worth it. Yeah, well, it, it seems like it's holding its value, the M series. So, like, hopefully the next few years or 30 or whatever, 40 years, they can hold that value still high and then you can make some profit or something of it. And then going back to the community, you need more people shooting films so that doesn't lose its value because people forget. But, you know, a couple of years back, those Leicas weren't costing a lot of money. Mm. Um, and all of a sudden people were like, all these photographers are shooting the Leica M6. There must be something about it. And then the price started going right back up. Yeah, man, it's from goddamn Joe Greer out here using that M6. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but, like, but, you know, Joe, and, and going back to people who actually share their work, like Joe has gone and showed what lenses he shoots, what, how he exposes. There's a video on YouTube where he like literally sitting in Santa Monica. He's got his three lenses. He tells you that he overexposes by one shot and he tells you exactly how he composes. He just told you his secret sauce. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, for free. Uh, he also has classes and all these people have classes and, you know, courses you can pay more for. But um, also a great point of somebody who moved from mobile photography to film photography. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's amazing. I also, I think uh, something what's amazing about him is how like, you know, he was in New York and everything, but now he's in Tennessee. And I think like some people, like at least a person on here, I uh, was saying like, I don't know. They were just saying like, it, it matters where you are and, you know, like city life and stuff. But I, at the same time, I didn't feel that because I feel like you have a mind, you can, wherever you are, you can get creative taking, like you were saying about the house and some of the greatest shots he ever shot. You know, I think we're, you can make 
make it work, I'm saying, whatever your subject or objects are? Yeah, I mean, there, there's clearly subject matter experts. Uh, I mean, somebody who's a subject matter expert of New York and San Francisco, they've nailed it down to like time of the day where there's more people, the right light, the right colors, there's nobody home, like they can figure it all out um, to a certain degree of creepiness. To the other degree of like, for example, you know, going back to Alex Burke, he's a travel photographer or a landscape photographer. His subject matter expertise is his way of capturing epic landscapes, like out of this world landscapes. No matter where you put him, you'll find that landscape. He'll probably do his homework, but he'll figure it out, but he'll take that. But there's also this thing about travel photography of like, part of the art is like looking at something as a newborn one more time. It's like, if you go to a place that you've never been before, you're going to notice things that not even a local notices because yeah. you're seeing everything for the very first time. Yeah. I think it's in like going back to what you just said right there, you're saying like, um, I remember, you know, it's always good to see other things and travel and see different things because like if you only shoot San Francisco that you're just thinking that's the world, you know, just seeing that. And it, I think, you know, travel, like at least photography has inspired me to get out of my comfort zone. A hundred percent. I I want to go out. I want to, you know, get up to people and like, cause I, I don't know what I shoot. I'm going to say street, but it doesn't feel straight. I just shoot Grant. That's what we're going with. That is what I'm trying to shoot out there. <laughs> and like, it makes me get out of my comfort zone because I like, I might see something happening in San Francisco. And I just like, I want to capture that. And I might be a little anxious of doing street photography and get in front of people. But like at the end of the day, if I get the photo, I feel better with myself because like I, I did something, I'm co- overcoming something that I probably wouldn't have done. I, I think it also informs you. There's a saying of like, you'll never step onto the same river twice. Yeah. Um, and it's the idea that, you know, once you go somewhere different and if you were to revisit that place again, you won't see it the same way twice you'll pick up on different things because whatever you've done before that will inform you to perceptively change your way of looking at that place. So like for me, like I grew up in Chile, that's where I'm from. Um, and I got lucky to fly like one year after the pandemic to go see my family. It was like not travel for leisure. It was travel for family sake. Like, holy crap, I have not seen my family in a year. And I get there and like, you know, there, the restrictions are easing up because it was summer. So I was able to kind of walk around my neighborhood and I realized that I, at the beginning when I was starting to walk, I was trying to look for those San, Fran- for those San Francisco flares, that like color, Pantone, like architecture. And then I realized I'm actually photographing something that is so familiar to me for decades, for something that's familiar to me for maybe two years. Mm. But then I compared the photos that I did that trip versus photos I've done in the past. And those photos were infinitely better because I had learned about light and shadows and and you're able to kind of capture that place in a whole different shape. Um, I remember when I went to Hong Kong, now I've only been to Hong Kong once and, and I consider myself lucky that I was even able to do that trip. But like, I went there and I was like a street photographer and I was like taking photos of people doing things and like Hong Kong felt like the right kind of way of doing it because you're being culture shocked every second. Um, I regret not going there as what I know now. Like, I feel like I could definitely make more justice to the place. Yeah. And I would disagree. I, I, I think, and obviously I spoke about really cool places, right? Like Hong Kong and things like that. But like my best work was in the suburbs of, south, of the South Bay of, San, of, 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 you know, the Bay. The South Bay of the Bay, you know, the Southern of San Francisco, mm-hmm. the Bay Area. And it was just suburb, it was suburbia. And for me, it was some of the work that I'm most proud of. Yeah. Because I was actually like, this is somebody's house, by the way, I think Toby told the story. Like I take photos of like people's homes, um, which can get scary sometimes. <laughs> and yeah, well, he was telling us, I think you were there with the story. Like you guys took a photo or something and the lady came out or something and he started running. And, and that's happened more than, more than my fair. But like my, my purpose is always, I am actually not, it's not me trying to invade your privacy. It's not me trying to, you know, break into your house or it's not me trying to document so I can then sell it. It's, it's about me finding your home beautiful. And that time that you put into making your house look that good. I just want to be able to like take it in. Um, so I think it's okay to err on the side of, I was doing this, here's my work. This is actually a compliment. It's not me trying to like 
frame you because I think that's something also that people like are afraid when you're but like this is it's funny when you're like street photography you're, you're doing street photography and people don't react to you taking them a photo on their phone but the minute you have a camera people react like very negatively towards you yeah being that it's very likely that if you're a film photographer that smartphone over there might take better photos than the one that you're currently trying to get there's more likelihood that your photo will come out blurred overexposed and all over the place whereas the smartphone will nail it um, but it's interesting to see people's reaction to the piece of hardware and going like, oh, no, what are you doing for this? And the purpose for that is because they think that you might actually be framing them up, yeah. um, trying to make money off their image or off something that they have, uh, or that your intention is not, but overall, that your intention is not a positive intention. Mm. Um, and I think just like street photographers, like you just have to show that there's an admiration for humanity and that you're just trying to put your work out there like you don't mean harm sometimes i had a guy like literally the story that toby told which by the way for those who have not heard it is that we were walking through the sunset took a photo of a house you know the owner of the house came out screaming at me um and coming after us and like we just kind of like you know i was not going to stand there and argue like you know what was going on i was just like i'm out mm -hmm. no the photo didn't even come out i think it was like a cab sitting on the on their on their window and the light was just hitting right i think that's sort of what i was trying to get but there was one moment living in the suburbs so this is specifically in an area called sunnyvale south of san francisco um i took a photo of somebody's um they had this beautiful kind of like uh garage door like filled with like trippy colors kind of reminded me of like sergeant pepper mm -hmm. uh the sergeant pepper's cover and like i took i mean and if you put that out there it's because you, you're you i mean it's in the street you're making that public it's the equivalent of a graffiti so like I took a photo of it and, and they heard the click, they heard the, 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 the you know, the, the, the shutter release. And the guy came out chasing me. Um, he didn't even put on his socks. He like just started biking without sock, without socks or shoes and came after me. I was with my wife and my dog. And I remember he was like, are you a spy? What are you? And like, you're not from around here. Like, what are you doing here? And like, he, he got very like, and we were just trying to calm him down. He's like, uh, show me that photo. I'm like, sorry, sir, but like this is a and, and he was of of the film camera days for sure. And I was like, sorry, it's a film camera. And he's like, I don't believe you that this is one of those digital cameras designed to spy on people so they can't see what you capture. I was like, no. And he was like, if it's a film camera, I want you to take out the film and like just dump it on the floor. And remember, this was one out of 36 photos that I taken yeah. that day. Yeah, shit. Sure. And I ripped off the roll, and I saw. I remember this so painful. I took off the roll. And, you know, it had all that work in there. And I just like, he tells me, throw it on the floor. And I see my role of like the celluloid just exposed to the sun. And then he was like, stay here. I'm going to call the police. I'm like, you know what? I'm like, I gave you what you want. I'm out. Like, yeah, fuck this. And guy. what you, re but what you realize is that even if you come with the best intentions, even if you're willing to explain what you're doing, people do have a right to privacy. That, that's, that's a given right. Yeah. Um, and if somebody doesn't want their photo, you know, it, it's hard for a film photographer to say, like, I promise I won't print it. I won't develop it. I like I'll exit. I'll like pass over it with a crayon. Like I'll, I'll just like eliminate that photo, snap it out, cut it, throw it into the trash. But they have no means of trusting you. Mm. Whereas, a, whereas a digital photographer can go like, I've deleted the photo. See, OK, what I, I've been in that situation. And well, first off, that guy, I understand privacy and stuff but he could be a lot nicer you don't have to come off like that oh, no, no. He, he had he had a few screws missing but like at the end of the day like there is nothing in this world that justifies your own security yeah for for me to put my my life at risk and and that's an overstatement like i don't think anything would have happened but like there's no photo that's worth your and this is important for everyone there is no photo that is worth your life yeah that is that like, is true. No matter how high you have to get or how far off the edge you have to go, nothing is worth that photo. Like, 100%. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, that's a good point because what I was about to say is like, I've been in that situation where someone's like, you know, delete that photo and, you know, being, a, I don't want to say wise ass or whatever. I was being a little clever grant here. I was just like, with the M6, you know, the R button reverse. I just yeah. did that and I said, all right, it's deleted, it's reversed, it's gone. And like, okay, thank you. And I just walked away and I just clicked back off reverse. And then I, I never posted it because I felt bad, but like, 
you know, I have the photo still of that person today. Yeah, I mean, and, and look, in 20 years or 10 years, or maybe even five years, you can post that photo. Um, I, I think it's just being mindful of people's privacy. And I think we're, we're hyper alert of what privacy means now. So we tend to overreact when somebody's infringing our privacy. Um, mind you that you don't mind about that selfie that you came out in the background, but you do care about like when somebody like, it's just, you know, cameras, specifically film cameras, make a lot of noise, they look clunky and professional, and they can definitely call somebody's attention. Um, I think the people who do it right are people who, I forgot who does this, but I've, I've met a few people by now, um, but it's who carry like a little bit of like a small photo book of their work and go like, hey, look, like here's what I, what I take photos of. That's I mean, no harm. Like this is where I'm putting you in comparison with. I think uh, that's- It wrong. might not always work. But yeah, it at least shows the person like, here's my page or whatever. This is the photos you see of all these other people. Understand. Um, there's a guy actually, maybe you heard of him, Eric Kim. Um, yeah. Yeah. Shout out to him because like he definitely like also biggest person who, who has guided me understand with his, you know, his website, his videos, you know, understanding the human mind. That whole, he's just a great, I love I, I wish I was able to go to some of his workshops. Um he, he does, he's like, I think he was based out of Mexico for a while. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. He just does a lot. And like he, well, he was the re a main reason, like got me to really just like pushing myself. By a Leica. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the Leica is because I found out my grandfather had a Leica, but it got, it was like, it, it, it needs to get fixed. And like, you know, and I was like, oh, this could be something cool, bonding here, you know, do something here with grandpa or something like that, or, or with my dad and whatever. But, the, but he inspired me with like getting the 28 millimeter because like after I got it, I was like, well, I'm going to try to buy used whatever. And he's like, read this whole article of his like, go 28. And I was like, so anyway, shout out to Eric for inspiring me for the 28. It's been an interesting I mean, ride. Eric, yeah. I mean, shout outs to eric and he's been kind of on mia for a while but um he's been making remember, music like, he's been making music funny enough like he last post i saw i was like this is how you make a beat and this is how it relates to your photo and i was like what is happening but that's sort of insane of him right like what he is he's a great educator because he like went to photography shared his journey with it then he i think got into weightlifting and kind of shared his journey about like getting fit and all that stuff and now he's a musician yeah. Those are people who are born educators that are able to like obsess about a detail, learn it back and forward, and then teach it back to somebody else. Yeah. Well, it's just great that he has all that research and like he, he has his free master classes. If for anyone who's actually interested in, you know, what we're talking about, just go to Eric Kim, I think it's Eric Kim Photography, or just type in Eric Kim, his website will come up and he has all these free master classes that you can just read or at least watch or see even his photos. He describes how he gets the angle and he had this one technique, I forget what it was called. And I, I've been trying to use it more. It's like, but you're getting personal with people. It's where you load the film. He's a, yeah. I was, just, I was just gonna say, you load the film, you get your, you know, um, you get everything set up, shutter speed, all of it, you know, and like your distance. And then you, you walk in front of someone and you take the picture and be like, oh, I'm sorry. And then you continue. So yeah, yeah. I, I remember saying that. He's also one of those big like range focusing people, right? Like, and I remember, I might be wrong, but he was like a big uh, Rico GR shooter. And I think he liked that snap focus. Is I that believe, right? I th That sounds familiar, but I don't want to confirm. But he, there's some video of that he was saying. Talking yeah, about. About, about him being like, what's great about the Rico is that whole like, you know, you know, five feet, same equivalent to the range focusing, yes. but like through the dial. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of like being able to get anything in that, you know, area of distance on, on, on sharp focus. Um, yeah, I know. I mean, Eric Kim is a great photographer. I mean, he was a great street photographer. He still is. No, oh, yeah. Uh, I just haven't seen any of his work. But yeah, I mean, no, I mean, the, the, the whole thing about where I was going to go is 28 millimeter as a focal length. Um, don't hate me on this. but No, it's let me crazy... know. T -t Tell me it all because Alex gave me his thoughts when I asked him for some advice. So it was just let it on. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I, I, I haven't heard Alex's version of this yet, but um, the TLDR for me, or it's too long, don't get too much into it, is 28 meter, millimeter focal length. It's just too much for me to take in. 
for me to actually understand what I'm focusing on, which is great for editing posts. Cause then I could be like, I got all of this, let me crop into this and just ignore everything else. But it kind of takes away the art of composition on the fly. Mm. And I feel like what that means for me is that I like that 35, that 50, I'm mostly a 50 millimeter shooter, but 35 is a sweet spot. It's this ability of being able to like get closer and being able to see elements enter and leave my frame and being able to like understand when I'm framing and limiting myself to the field of view where I, it's my canvas. Yeah. Right. So like, there's a lot going on, but here's my canvas. And part of like 35 and 50 is that you're isolating the elements around you to focus and drive your attention to a specific area, which if you shoot on a 28 millimeter, you can crop and get the same result. The thing about for 28 is just, it feels too wide. And depending on the lens, you might even get some lens aberration and some other details here and there. But I just feel that it's a very hard focal length for me to work on because there's just too much going on. Yeah, I don't know if like Alex Burke swore through it because well, you know, landscape photography in 28 seemed to be a sweet spot. He just kind of yeah. said, he just like, he, he didn't like, you know, I know you're, you're hundred percent right. Like it's definitely hard. I literally just said any advice you could give to someone who uses the 28 and he's like, I told him like, I'm either too far or I'm just too close. And it's hard for me to find that middle spot. And this was literally just Monday. I don't know why I'm having a hard time remember what he's fully saying, but like, basically he was just trying to say like, you know, um, to your point, like 35 is the sweet spot. And for someone who's just trying to like figure out street photography and stuff, he probably should start at 35 and, you know, 20, yeah. you really got to, basically, you really got to know what you're doing. You know, that's, that's what he was just I basically trying to tell me, you know, really got to like, um, don't be too afraid to get a little bit closer, but understand how close you're getting. And it's like, I was like, okay, I, I feel like I knew that, but you know, I, I like no, no shitting on Alex. I, I appreciate any. Yeah. I mean, 28 people who get 28 millimeters get 28 millimeters, right? Like street photographers who can control 28 millimeter focal length, like their photos are amazing. Uh, you know, Elliot Erwig, like hell, I don't, you know, he doesn't, but like the fact is, is that for me, it's just too much information to isolate my subject. Yeah. And I've been, and it also about, means, yeah, go ahead. No, go, I was just saying, I've been, I've been pondering the idea of switching to a, you know, 50, maybe or 35, or just something closer, just like closer. If I get something intimate, you know? Or, or the Holy Grail, which unfortunately not very compatible with the M6, but the the Minolta Rockcore 40 millimeters with the M mount, that is a beautiful lens, but you won't get frame lines for it. So you'll have to like do math of like, this is a 50, this is a 35. I'm somewhere in between. Um, <laughs> unless you're willing to get like an LCE or, or another smaller kind of uh, M mount system, which doesn't make sense at this stage. But 50 for me is a sweet spot. And why I like 50 so much is because it allows me, once again, I mostly shoot, I don't know what to call them, urban landscapes. And uh, I'm getting close to people's homes. So I don't wanna be too close. Mm -hmm. I wanna be far enough that I can still get my shot, but not get on other people's business. Okay, yeah. And I just accustomed myself to being a 50 millimeter shooter. For me, 50 millimeters is like where I feel at home. And it's funny because every time I get a camera, I go like buying the 28. I'm like, why did I buy the 28? I'm just not a 28 millimeter shooter. 35. It's like, if you only, if I can leave home with only one lens, 35 is the one. Um, and, yeah. And that's what I've been like, just because I don't know, like, I think if you heard the whole podcast with uh, Toby, then, you know, like at the end of April, going to South of France or whatever for a week to see some people. Yeah. Stuff. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Great. Couch surf, the whole deal learn the culture, see what people, what all, it's all good. But the question is, and I was talking to this with um, Drew, was that um, I don't know if 28 is the move. I feel like if I like, if I want that elderly person smoking their cigarette, drinking their coffee, I don't think I want the whole fucking, you know, see everything. I just want that one person in the chair news. Like, you know, and I feel like the 50 is the move for it. So I'm like, yeah, I mean, I mean, the way that I figure it out, I had this, um, once again, lucky me, I got to go to Iceland a couple of months back and um, which was like my bucket list things I wanted to do, you know, before I like dropped dead and it was like Iceland. And I remember there was this moment of like me having all my gear on my floors, like what the hell do I take? Um, and then it ended up being that I actually took the 35 and the M6. Um, but 
sorry, no, I took the 50 millimeter and the M6. However, my highly recommendation is if you've got a cheap point and shoot, which by the way, you can buy ones that are 50 bucks and already you'll get a killer photo. Uh, shout out to the Minolta a AFC is um, most of those come in 28 millimeters. So when you need that 28 millimeter, everything sharp on focus, kind of like the street situations, and you want to pass completely unknown to other human beings, a point and shoot does its work beautifully. I'm not telling you to go get a Contax T2, yeah. but hell, like uh, the Minolta AFZ, which I found, my mom found for me at a thrift store, gave to me as a birthday gift, costs under 50 bucks. And it's some of the sharpest lens that I've ever used. It's like a, I believe it's a 35 2.8. Okay. And trust me, that performs beautifully. I mean, I wouldn't tell you to shoot night photography with it, but it does its job. It gets really great photo photos. I One of my favorite photos was of the Red Java's Cafe underneath the Bay Bridge. Mm -hmm. Shot that with a $50, mil, a $50 camera. Um, and I've tried to go there with like my Leica glass and like, I can't get that photo again. Only what, yeah, it, I mean, I mean that, but that just shows you like, like those cameras, you know, that are 50 or, or maybe a hundred, they have those lenses. And I think, and it, it blows your mind yeah. versus like you're saying with the Leica. And I think that's sort of like, if I was traveling to Italy or France or, you know, these, like, I imagine these Parisian kind of like beautiful, like, yeah, I would take a 28 millimeter point and shoot. And your can't miss always gets it right, lens and body. And they just let that be your travel kit. You can throw it in a backpack. You can move around. You won't be scared and concerned about like where your 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 gear is. So, like you'll have it down to the minimum liability. Well, anyone, if you're listening, if you want to buy 28 from me, let me know. I 28 Tubercon. Uh I think it goes to I think it's two to twenty-two, you know, for the you know. Yeah. Uh, so that's I mean, how, once again, don't spend, never spend more money than you have and don't well, no, of buy course. extra gear just for a trip, but might be an unpopular belief, but if you're going to your dream travel, you know, the gear cost is going to be the minimum cost. Well, yeah. And, and like I, the South of France has always been on the bucket list ever since I saw midnight in Paris, even though that's in Paris, I want to go to South of France because it seems low key, it seems chill. And I have friends, a lot of friends who live there. So I was like, it would be great yeah. to go out there and just like. Also, yeah. if you're going to meet up friends, a point and shoot is the most discreet camera. You can put it on pocket, just walk and get the photo, right? If oh, you yeah. take your Leica, you might be conscious of like, where did I leave it? Where do I take it? Can I just wear it on? Can I not? You know, if I'm going to go and find, like you might end up yourself in a beautiful party one night and you're going to be like, crap, I got my Leica. What do I do? Do I just hang it out my, like, oh yeah. you know, make sure you have a camera that you don't care that it gets a little bit beat up. No, a hundred percent for your everyday carry. Well, and I always thought maybe like the Leica I would go on like trips and stuff or whatever. Like, like if I going out and going out to the countryside or whatever I'm doing, take that. But like my friends were going out. I mean, this is still a nice camera, but I haven't used, it's like the AE one. That's what I started with. And it was AE one program. So, you know, if I wanted to just shout like, out to the OG, yeah. Yeah. If I want, it's not, I mean, not the quietest point and shoot but you know it still does it still does its work you know what i mean and um if you yeah. just want to go out and, there take it boom but yeah i mean to be fair you only had the one it, once again this isn't a typical question that a lot of people say it's like your lonely island camera if that's your like of your 28 millimeter you can get everything right just take that one camera but if you want to take your camera on everything you do then yeah i, I would suggest a very cheap point and shoot can get you amazing photos and because what it does is that it lets you live your life without getting in the way of like, what do I do? Where do I leave this? Am I going to be safe with it? Once again, I think the South of France, you'll be fine. But, you know, if you were to go to, you know, more riskier places, like maybe, you know, you don't want to flaunt the Leica around. Yeah, no, definitely. I like, like, for sure. I, there's, I'm very careful with it. And even Drew told me something like some people, like, I didn't know that some people will take black tape and cover Leica, like the, the gaffer tape yeah i didn't even know that was a thing when he told me that i was like oh shit i probably should be thinking about this like i didn't even think about that i like actually charges more money for a model that doesn't have the red dot wow that's yeah that's my but mind. yeah i think people use gaffers tape i think there's also people who use like car decals and like they kind of just put it like whatever doesn't harm the camera um 
Look, I, I, I've been through like Latin America with a Leica over my shoulder. You know, the only thing you ever have to be careful about is you're in a safe place. You are behaving safely. You're not calling attention onto yourself and you're being respectful of everybody else. Like having said that, I've been robbed. <laughs> and um, what hurt most was not the camera. Once again, not the Leica, um, but you know, what hurt most was like the photos, like those are gone. So my only suggestion to anybody traveling is once you're done with the role, leave it in a safe place. Um, if that safe place is your pocket or that safe place is like leaving it in wherever you're staying and leaving it behind, don't carry around all your photos with you. I think that that's huge because like, I don't know, like the type of photography, like, can I just kind of like, you know, we're talking about like what we like to shoot and like what we post on our pages and stuff. Like I've been trying to figure out, you know, what does Grant like to shoot? And I think something would be cool is to shoot like, like you know what's going around in the world and like maybe shoot like issues that are happening like so i want to like a big place i want to go to is brazil and show the fajitas and show like the government and show what's happening to these locals and i think that would be amazing to shoot but i have a friend who lives in brazil and he was just telling me he had like you know his classical guitar out there got robbed took the guitar i know this is a different comparison but like I want to shoot, I don't know where this is going basically, but if you get where I'm trying to connect the dots where I want to shoot yeah. places where I can show what's like the true, what's happening around the world, but not, you know, lose, like you're saying the film or camera. That is like- Yeah, I, I mean, the, the first thing is like, you know, obviously, you know, talk to somebody you trust make sure that if you're gonna photograph something sensitive that you have you know, explicit permission no, exactly. from that community before you come in. Um, you know, they're, they're not unused to photographers coming their way. I think they just wanna make sure that it's not the wrong, going back to this example of the guy who like, you know, almost killed me. It, it just goes down to like ensuring that they know your purpose, which is documentation versus like misframing it. Um, so the first thing it's like, reach out to the community, reach out to somebody who can help you connect and just make sure that, you know, they know that you're just not a tourist coming in for the exhibition, but that you're actually coming in to document in like in a positive way. The second thing is, I don't know if anybody's ever said this before in, in, the, in the podcast, because it seems like I'm, I'm stepping on territory of bigger people than me, but like never love your gear to the point where you're scared of losing your gear. You are the first. Yeah. I mean, it's okay to feel emotionally attached to that gear, but if you're emotionally attached to the gear, don't take it to places where the risk might be high. Yeah, I think that's a big um, realization to realize, you know, even like, because yeah, I love the Leica, but like, you're right. If I, if I, I like, I'm still connected to the A1, 100%, great camera. But if, if I had to choose, if I had someone at gunpoint with me and wanted to rob me, take the A1 by all means. Yeah, and and you know it's funny with me. It's like if I had my A one and my M six, my emotional attachment is to my dad's camera. So I'd be like, "Here's the M well, six. Well, yeah, if there's a um, yeah, and I and I think once again, I I heard somebody say once, like, uh, "Don't ever emotionally get attached to a camera." But if it's something that you've inherited, that's a different meaning. But at the end of the day, it's you know, the Leica is a machine, and it's meant to be out there and be hit like, like it's very different for people who are like, Oh, I don't want to take out the camera. Cause it might get dented or like, you know, get some usage or brass. Like that's what the camera was assigned to do to live a tough life. Hell it's predecessor stopped the bullet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think that's a Nikon FM actually, or FA. but in, in the world of like, you know, like, yeah. in in, in an area where it's risky, where it's just beyond the fact that it'll get beat up. It's a, you might lose the camera um and nobody's gonna be like all right take the camera but let me take out the film or let me take out the lens so you can just take the nobody's gonna do that like yeah. and they're taking it they're taking it and at no point going back to the early comment is that camera gonna be worth your life um you're worth more than an m6 like let that be a clear message to anybody like no there, there's no life value equal value to the m6 and i think that's a big thing to realize because like yeah i think I think that's a well said point. Like it's supposed to take the beating. Like, like it can handle it. This is what it's made. Like the German engineering of it. And like I don't know. I actually like when 
cameras aren't new when they rust and everything. I think it has a certain look. Yeah. To it, you know, they, when they show their brassing, they're showing their personality. Yeah. Uh, the same thing could be said about a guitar or uh, like, like exactly. What, what, yeah. They gain some personality. There's some that, that are not needed. There's times that they get a beating. And you're like, I could have totally avoided that. Um, but I remember being on Alcatraz Island with this camera and my dad there, he was visiting San Francisco for the first time. And I took this camera and then suddenly this camera fell off the boat into the dock. Felt like, I, I, in my head, it felt like 15 times over. In reality, it only touched the floor once. And I'm like, crap, I broke my dad's camera in front of my dad. And I go like, grab the camera, look at it and like, nothing at all like nothing it's dirty yeah and then i was just like never mind and then i look at the floor and i see like a small crack that probably was there i was just like yeah this this can handle a few beatings before like it, it damages itself and it didn't it didn't do anything differently after like i took photos and it kept on working it, it doesn't rattle or not more than it should rattle or that i thought it could originally rattle probably not out of box but yeah yeah cameras are meant to be loved and get some rough love. And actually, yeah, if you're selling a pristine Leica, like you, 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 you kept it for collection, which by the way, you know, finder's credit. Yeah, well, you know, I like, it's a great camera, but the camera that I want to get fixed is my father or grandfather's camera. That seems more meaningful because he had that in the fifties or something. And like, you know, the, there's photos of my dad when he was younger that was shot on it. And then my grandfather, yeah. you know, well, there are some photos of like surgery. Don't know if that was legal or with what, what was going on there, but you know, it, it, there was just some amazing, crazy photos he has on there. So like, that would be cool to get fixed. And I think, like you said, the meaningful, the history behind it, and it's like has Alfred Evans on it. And it's like the street and like where he lived in Wisconsin, the whole deal, it's great. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, the trip will be fun. Imagine you had that camera to go on the trip. You'd, you'd be taking your grandpa over to, you know, Southern France. Oh yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, back to your, your meta point, like at the end of the day, it's whatever camera works for you. Um, just don't take a new camera. Cause like, you'll be figuring out the camera while you're there. Yeah. So <laughs> something ridiculous I did and shout out to, if you have not met up with her yet, uh, Han Fawn, um, she, um, <laughs> Uh, right before I went to Iceland, I was like, what, what, what film stock should I take? And what lenses should I take? And then every time I meet up with a few folks, including Han to shoot, I would take the same gear and pretend I was shooting in Iceland. So by the time I get there, I like already know how the film exposes, what I have to do, the setup, how it fits into my everyday carry. And like, by the time I got there, all I had to do was point and shoot. Like I had no longer had to worry about like, oh, do I use, you know, Fuji 400H for this? Or do I use, you know, you know, color plus 200? Like I had already figured out all the small little details. Um, so yeah, before you go on that, go out, get mileage and then go. Yeah, honestly, that is some wise advice because there's sometimes like, like you gotta know your like surroundings and like know at least the temperature or what, what, the, what, what you're about to shoot, like learned while back, uh, you know, always, you know, exposed with snow you know what i mean if you because you, you know you wanted to come out and stuff or like there was one i had i was i think i was texting yeah it was drew or it was eddie i forget who it was but i was like you know i had 800 in and i was like i'm at the beach and i was like well this even fucking come out you guys and like yeah you're totally fine and like whatever and i was trying to you know push um is it pushing or pulling going to 200 i think the term is pull. pushing and pulling it's in developing uh but over and under exposing over of. okay there we go over and well i was like moving it to like even though the film was 800 i was saying to the like a, it's 200 oh yeah yeah yeah. you're basically kind of like purposely overexposing it yeah so you kind of get that like less shadows more like yeah so i do I, that with my 400 i shoot 200 and when i'm at 800 crazy enough once i shot 200 i don't think i'll ever do that again but it worked out yeah depending on the film you've got a lot of latitude yeah well, so they, when I said I did 200, it's like, no, stick to four or eight. And I was like, okay. And I saw the 200 yeah. photos and they, they came out, you know, they're okay. But the, the 800 were the best, just sticking with the actual film it's in. And, and, I was, and it, it depends because the, the terms that you said, push and pull, is when you actually ask to be push and pull in developing. So that means that they'll actually 
develop it as if it was a 400 or a 200, or you can grab an 800 and under like pull it or push it. Um, and it'll behave differently. Um, I've only done it in black and white photography. I don't think I've ventured into like getting colors right the first time is already a pain in the, so I don't know if I put it through the paces, but once again, it's all about experimenting. Um, yeah, but 800 at 400, you're, you're super good. Oh, well, uh, yeah, now I, I'm learning. So, you know, and I always, I was thinking like you were saying through this, through our conversation, it's like, I kind of want to buy black and white and just test it out and see what it would look like with the beach or, or like really see what I can do with it out here in SoCal for just this week and stuff and see, can I push or at least test my creativity and see where I can go with it. And I'll just go with like, I uh, recently went on a walk with um, a few folks, um, you know, Justin Pham, uh, left foot forward, Carlos, um, and a few folks, including, you know, Tofi, who, by the way, Tofi takes at Instagram, great guy. And um, it was funny seeing them shoot black and white and then putting like different color filters to accentuate different colors, mm. and subdue others. And also like, we were talking about like, you know, uh, metering for 1600, but you're shooting 400 film, like, you'll be so, you know, one to go back to community, like if you're surrounded by folks who've like tried and, and trial and error, um, it just helps because black and white photography is a hard thing to get right. Same thing with slide film, like slide film, you know, specific, not slide film, sorry, um, cinema film. So like Kodak Vision, you know, with the, with the Remjet layer, you also need to like warm it because it's too cool. Like you, it's a whole science. So like, you know, getting close to people who have actually gone through the motions is a good one. Or it's also part of the, just you going out and figuring things out on your own. Just remember the cost of figuring it out. You, you might find out some surprises afterwards. Yeah, well, shout out to um, this one film photographer. Hi, mate. Uh, his uh, ad is, uh, I had him on the podcast. It's Como Sayama, I think he, is what it is. And like, uh, he's great, you know. Um, and he had on his page, he has like, you know, your little stories of each film, you know, Kodak 400, Kodak 800. And he shows his shot. He, uh, he has, you know, shot with those films and presents them on his film and talks about what, how he used them for certain settings and like why it worked out. And I think it's just great that he uh, shows that for people who are learning, you know, and trying to understand what, what are the advantages and disadvantages with this film for certain days. Yeah. So shout out to him for like, you know, teaching that stuff. And everybody who puts out their process online, it's just so amazing that they're they're willing to open that door and kind of like show their trial and error. Um, one of my favorite lives, every time somebody's doing like a develop with me session, I'm like jumping into those and kind of like understanding what are they doing? What's their process like? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, once again, coolest thing about the film community is definitely the people that you meet in the way and their willingness to share and being open with what they're creating. Yeah. No matter where in the world, like I've talked to folks that are like, and the other side of the world and they're like having the same questions that we are and like basically it's discovering with people who might have already tried it out it really is and you know i've been trying to like i've been shooting lately with you know kodak but like with kodak prices and everything's going up i like maybe i can find a different film that it doesn't have to be kodak and jaime always talks about like fuck the portraits like let's do experiment and i'm like yeah, I'm just kind of like addicted to that, like certain type of film stock and all that. Maybe food. I mean, I, don't know. I mean, uh, as somebody who's gone through as much film as I possibly can. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge geek for Color Plus. There's something I, I find a sweet mix on Color Plus, but it really depends on like the colors you like, right? Like, um, you know, Christopher Stern was on a, I think it was like um, analog talk, uh, the podcast, the crispy, and and he he mentioned something that's super real, which is even if you shoot Fuji, even if you shoot portrait, even if you shoot color plus or Silvera, whatever you might find, going back to this editing thing, you're gonna edit it to make it look like what you want it to look, and it might end up being that you know your Fuji 400 ends up looking like Portra, or it might be that your Portra ends up looking like Fuji, like the thing that you need to get right is enough film to give you enough latitude that's just so you don't mess it up yeah and make sure that it's enough and, and this is my interpretation it's like get familiarized with a film that you might not always get so if you should portrait 400 exclusively or 800 
try to find a cheaper stock that you can also learn how to control. So if you're, you know, one day in the southern part of France and they don't have Fortra, but they have Fuji 200, you already know how that Fuji 200 is going to behave. Yeah. I think that's... Because you can make that Fuji 200 look like a portrait. You can. It's, yeah, I think with the technology we have and everything, it's, yeah, you just got to be patient and, like, you know, learn. And that's it. Yeah. And probably do more, like, color corrections and things like that. But, like, at the end of the day, like, you know, it, it doesn't hurt specifically now with the price is ragingly increasing to find a cheaper stock. Well, do you think it will ever uh, go down, the prices? You think right now this, they're just doing this and then some point maybe uh, Kodak will come back down for everyone? I've heard. I've heard of everything. I mean, if you look at the prices over the last five years, they've been increasing steadily over the time. Um, I, I read somewhere that it has nothing to do with like, I mean, there's components driven by the inflation. I mean, we're in a historical inflation mm -hmm. post a pandemic, which has already restrained supply chains across the world. I don't know if you looked at your Kodak lately, but it's no longer black aluminum around sort of the canister. Um, so like it definitely like prices have been increasing. Film wasn't doing too well before all of this. Mm. Um, and, you know, they've closed down a lot of the factories that were producing film. Um, so what you're buying right now is like limited factories who can still produce um, with a supply chain and inflation. Even if the inflation has gone and the supply chain fixes itself, there's no more factories producing film. So we're still like all buying very limited amount of film. Wow. I, I think the end result is hopefully we still invest on it and we still buy film to a point where imagine we all like, oh, film got too expensive. Let me not like, I'm not going to buy a Kodak anymore. Kodak is going to go ahead and start shutting more factories. And at the end of the day, we're just going to run out of film. So what the only way this could be fixed is just more players in the market. So that means more people creating new film because um, that means more factories and more film, more competition. And then that would definitely bring the prices down. Um, that's my interpretation of things roughly from the outside. No, oh, yeah. I'm hoping prices go down. I mean, if the inflation goes down, the prices might go down a bit, but even if you put it on a five line and on a five year line, that price is still going up. Like it's not, it's never been going down. I mean, that, I think the part that just would just, I mean, hopefully doesn't happen is that film just goes extinct and just in general. And that's why, you know, folks like you who help connect the, you know, people who are shooting film and photographers with like, it's just bridging that gap and ensuring that we still inspire more people to go out and, and shoot film yeah. um, and make sure that people are buying, even if we're buying less and being more careful of those 36 shots, uh, or maybe every time we hear about a price increase, we're filling our fridge with film. Um, we're helping this stay alive. Oh, yeah. um, it doesn't mean that I, I, for example, I've been dabbing a little bit more back on digital and being like, I don't have to go and burn 36 photos of my walk commute to work. Like the digital might get me through and get me those like, you know, bits and snacks of photos. And then I'm just more purposeful when I go out and shoot film. Like, here's what I want to shoot today. Here's where I'll spend a day. I want to take about 10 to 15 photos. I want this role to last me three days. Whereas in before I was like loaded up. And if I found something interesting, 36 photos later, I've burned, burned through them all. And that, and, and you make such a great point because I'm coming around with digital, you know, just because I'm, I'm, I'm definitely like that person, you know, who loves, I guess you could say the oldies, you know, anything analog. I love tube amps. I love vinyl. I love whatever tape reel to reels and like the film. Yeah. I, I love, I love, I love it all. But then like, you know, being, you know, wise or frugal with my money lately with everything's happening it's like there's nothing wrong with digital like it, like there's that weird you know whole beef or whatever like you're either a film person or you're a digital it's like nah shut the fuck up like you can do whatever and, you by, and by the way most photographers who are contemporary to us and who have you know are professional photographers they also have a digital camera on their kit What's amazing that they've been able to do is create a look and feel that no matter if it's digital or film, you know, it's them. a photographer for me who gets that right every time, no matter what they're shooting is folks like, you know, Dino Kuznick, shout out to him. Um, I don't know if you know his work, but like he's shooting medium format, digital and film. And no matter what you're getting, it's his work. Yeah, um, that's like Eddie. Luz yeah, hell yeah. Eddie does that with, you don't know if he's shooting on the Q2 or if he's shooting yeah. on his M6. All you know, it's his Eddie's work. 
Um, and, and I think that's the level of detail when somebody's mastered their colors, the medium no longer closes them into what they were able to develop, right? There might be some level of investment of like working through it, you know, putting a photo next to the other, trying to equalize them, trying to figure out what that science is. But once you figure that out, and that's also kind of exciting because you're, you're proposing yourself a challenge. Um, and it might not look the same. It might lose some personality. Um, you know, you can adapt your Leica lens over to your, you know, digital body. And, you know, back to what we said, the lens is what matters the most in the equation if we're talking gear. So like, you know, you should come close. The sensor matters too, by the way, like, but that's a different discussion I'm not going to geek out on now. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I mean, there's, there's amazing, like, like a photographer too, like Lucy Lott, um, who I don't know if you know her, but she exclusively shoots on like a Leica M6, and I believe uh, now a Leica M11, probably since she's an ambassador. But I can't distinguish which one's film and which one's digital. Yeah. And she's just nailed it. She's nailed the color, the science, her composition. You do, you can tell she's shooting on a 35 1.4. Um, but that's because that lens has too much personality for its punch. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Teresa Freitas also from Portugal. I don't know if you've seen her work. It feels like a pastel dream. I don't know what she's shooting with most of the time. See, that's incredible. And I haven't like, I haven't realized that. And like, again, going back to Eddie, shout out to Eddie, because like he mentioned it. And then after he told me on the podcast, I, you know, I saw, I was looking at some of his photos. And I was like, yeah, what the fuck? They just, how, you know, it's just beautiful, his work. And I, I don't, I couldn't even tell, like, maybe a little bit yeah some of the green but it was like no nah, like it was it was hard and eddie's photos shout out to eddie for reals i never know and I, sometimes i have to message him and be like was this on the cure was this on the, like it's like you need to know for your own self comfort of like yeah what's going on um but yeah i mean once again i think and, and this is sort of like if you get into some photographer because they shoot film and then they share digital and you like both works. Then you like the photographer. You only like people's film photos and not their digital work. Then you like part of their work, mm -hmm. which is not bad, right? Like back to music. You can like an artist for its band, but when they go solo, you're like, hell is to the no. Yeah. Um, and that's fine. That means basically there is one aspect of his craft or their craft that just doesn't resonate with you. And that's totally fine. Um, yeah, no, but, um, definitely one of those things where I'm dabbling more on digital and, you know, some people go like, why the hell are you shooting digital? And, and the answer is, I don't know, just future proofing myself to a certain degree. Yeah. And I think, and that's totally fine. And that's totally fine. And there shouldn't be like, you should only, you have to pick a side or anything. You just do whatever makes you happy and, you know, yeah. and yeah. whatever camera you were that inspired you to pick yeah. it up. Like, for example, like I started shooting a little bit more digital uh, with the X-Pro2, uh, which is like a very dated five to seven year old Fuji camera. I think you can find it under $800, $700. Fuji lenses, since the film days have been like heads down, beautiful lenses. They know their, their lens science, uh, their glass science. And, um, and that just made me pick up that camera. Suddenly I was like out shooting. I was like, oh crap, I forgot to bring a film camera. And that was not a bad feeling. It was just like, this is a camera that I pick up when I leave. Um, yeah, no, I mean, one thing is, you know, if you're, you're solely a film photographer, invest on a digital, doesn't have to be expensive. You've already probably got the lenses. Just adapt those into a cheap digital film and you'll probably have fun. Yeah. I mean, the way I started with was the Canon, I think rebel, uh, E O at E S O E O it's something like one of those. Yeah, E O S. Yeah, yeah. Basic. That's what I started with. And like, and it's still a great camera. Love it. Love it. It just sits on, you know, my shelf now and I haven't touched it. But like you said, it's still I could go if out. You need and, it, it's there. And yeah. by and by the way, cool thing about shooting a digital camera is if you're looking into scanning at home, you can do DSLR scanning. Yeah. So not only did you get a camera, you just got a scanner. Well, that's, that's what uh, I'm really excited about, trying to learn how to scan and try to understand how to edit, you know, in Photoshop yeah. and Lightroom and all that. 
Yeah, and, and I think it's just, you know, fun. If you're into it for photography, there's a portion of it that it's discovering gear. Um, there's a point, and by the way, like digital camera manufacturers know that film is on the rise. And trust me, they're looking at what works in film to get people to purchase digital. Because like, once again, also if you think about sustainability, film isn't exactly our front. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. Chemicals we're putting into waterways the plastic on the like, but yeah, but it's uh, it's the beauty of the art. Um, all that to say is, digital is digital can be fun. I think there, if you're coming from film to digital, the good thing is that you've educated yourself on the color science. Mm -hmm. So once you get the digital, the challenge is, you know, can it look like my other work? Yeah, and I know people like I've seen people try to like take digital and they like it's like youtubes and like on photoshop make the digital turn in photoshop it into film or like add a cover on it so people like to make it look like analog or whatever and i'm like okay you know it's it is what it is do whatever makes you happy at the end of the day yeah i mean that's it right and 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 you know there's people that go out and buy films and pre i mean sorry film presets and like profiles and things and that works for them there's people who do it manually and figure it all out. There is no right or wrong way. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you're buying those presets and those film packs, like you're helping somebody who's like, you know, trying to yeah. make a business out of it. So it's all good. The way to think about it is, you know, if Radiohead is your film, you want Tom York to be your digital. Um, oh. And that's all to say, like, you don't feel like you're listening to two different artists. You feel it's all part of that same universe. Uh -huh. Just to wrap it up with a music reference. Yeah. Definitely. I, I appreciate it. Thank you like so much for being on here and talking to me, Sebastian. It's great. I mean, I will, I like, I have one question to ask you before you go off, if you have time real quick. Of course. Yeah. So I know this might be like an in-depth question. It might be hard to just give a single answer, but what are your thoughts on, and I'm trying to understand this is film or digital, just photographer in general, uploading their work on nfts the whole i know that's a whole can i know that's a whole can i trust here you. here i was thinking i got away without talking about crypto and i was just like because that is something that just it just goes over my head i'm just like i don't know it's something like i thought maybe but then i heard you have to pay like rent to have it up on there onto the nft for your work and i yeah. don't know it's just so confusing I mean, I, I wish I knew, like, I'm still trying to catch up on like what the web three is, how blockchain helps technology. Like there's this whole thing about like, I understand that this is like pushing technology forward, that there's net positive things in the world for it. You know, it decentralizes a lot of the economy and decentralizes a lot of the services, all net wins, how that's gonna come and be like, I am trying to figure that out. And I'd rather do it sooner than later because I, my day job isn't that, not on crypto, but in, in, in tech industry, right? So like, need to figure out what that means. Um, as it regards to NFTs, I think, you know, going back to community and culture, and by the way, there's amazing photographers that I admire and follow who are fully into NFTs and been sucked into that void. But there's something about the community that feels like different and distinct from the film community. Mm. Um, I understand the inherent value and i think about it more of a kickstarter contribution than an ownership contribution because let's be honest if like if you buy somebody's work out of nfts you technically can't mandate that you own the rights to that photo or that content um you've just supported your artist with money you've basically it's the equivalent of buying a print with a few more benefits and i've seen photographers and artists do this where it's like you're buying my nft i'll give you like I'll mail you the negative or, you know, I'll, I'll give you a one hour talk with me about like how I shot the photo. Um, and I feel like there's values in that. There's like a, a creator economy that's being born out of that, that I really admire. And I know that there's another side of things in that industry, which is people trying to, they don't care what they buy. They're just trying to generate revenue over your work um, and, 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 and mint it, uh, which I think it's a term for like, get the blockchain going. Um, but my, my TLDR here is that for me, it's just still too early to know what the benefit is for me as an individual artist. I see a great opportunity on kind of this creator Kickstarter approach, which is like help self fund the work and kind of being able to deliver a differentiated value than I would otherwise post their work on, on a print shop, um, make it more accessible to somebody who might not be able to physically get your print. 
Uh, prices are crazy. And that's sort of the second point is that those prices seem a little bit crazy. Uh, not, not to say that there's not photos that are worth a million dollars. Um, but it just kind of makes me doubt about the economical component on the back, um, which I need to learn more before I, I dive in. So for me, it's, I'm interested on the creator economy component of it. I just don't understand what's driving the pricing. Do you think it will last this um, NFTs or do you think it will sizzle out? NFTs are a byproduct of a blockchain economy, right? And like, that's not going anywhere. Um, the question is, what is, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it, but these things are going for ridiculous prices. Yes. <laughs> and I'm super happy because it's made some photographers' lives easy. Er. Um, but like, at the end of the day, I don't know enough to invest on it. I. I hope it works because I want the photographers who are succeeding on it to stay along for the long term. Mm -hmm. I would not want this to become the scam that we'll watch some Netflix documentary in a few years on. Yeah, honestly, you don't need. I know people are getting scammed. Like, that's a fact. Um, but not every work is scammable. So, like, <clears throat> sorry. All good. <laughs> Oh, you're muted. I'm still muted. Oh, no, you're good. You're good now. Yeah, but I, I love to see what it built on to. Um, I think there's more good than bad. I just don't know what that. Sweet. Yeah, no, that 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 was just like. It's always it's just been there, you know, you, you, I see it on Twitter and like I see people, we talk about it and see people talk about it. And it's like is this a way that could pay for my film or this hobby that I love instead of using yeah. my audio engineering money for, to pay for it, you know? And I, and I want it to be that. It'd be great to go and tell my family, like I actually make money out of this versus actually mm -hmm. burn money on it. Um, but I, I think, you know, I don't think it's a, it's, you know, people who got early on crypto, those were early trendsetters. It feels like now it's just become mainstream. Yeah. The question is, what's our place in all of it and how do we get better access to being educated on the benefits that it is it's still highly technical so it's still highly required like the barrier to get into it is still highly complicated it, it really it really is and like i hopefully you know like in the film community people will and i see some people but they will start explaining how they started from like level zero ground the base and to where they are now in the NFT world and explain how they did everything and which way, where the right ways, because yeah, YouTube's great, but YouTube sometimes don't give the right answers. As I learned, at least in the music scene, like too many <laughs> people tell you how to make a beat in five minutes. That's not what you want. So, yeah. But uh, I mean, what's great about it is that, you know, this is all part of a bigger movement. I think NFTs are one way of like being able to own and support an artist and being able to also, you know, for the folks buying like, before it used to be like, how do I get things for free? And now it's like, how do I invest on someone? Yeah. I think it's, it's an interesting change on, and what's great about it is that it's making a lot of other careers like graphic design or, you know, multimedia artists, like being able to sell their work and make it more accessible. So like, and this has changed a lot. Cause if you would have asked me this question a year ago, I would have been like, you know, it's a conspiracy theory and whatnot. And now I'm like, this shit's real. We need to figure out what it means for people who actually create content and we need easier barriers to educate ourselves into what it can mean for us. Like, yeah. it'd be great if I can make money out of it, quit my day job and raise a family with it. I think it's so far off from that, at least for me. No. Yeah. I think it's going to take time and seeing people, at least in the music industry, like learning in business music is like they're trying to get away from royalties and going to nfts for your music and it's like that's a whole mind fuck to me i'm like i'm just you i'm just used to the royalties the percentage i get from spotify apple whatever now we're talking about how we're gonna boycott this a little and we're gonna do nfts for our music and just like i'm like okay i gotta figure out which is the law i want to play the long run game here what's gonna pay off then make a quick dollar but I think there's value to, you know, 
getting into it and understanding it, if the investment cost is easy, like if I can buy a $5 NFT, yeah, why not? Like, okay. I'm no longer opposed to the idea. Like, I've created an OpenSea account. I have figured out how to connect to this thing, the wallet. Like, I figured it out and connected the dots. Now it's like, what do I do with it? Yeah. Also, you don't want to get to the point where everybody's bought real estate in the meta world and then you're joining last and going like, oh, crap, I guess I'm going to have to rent. Yeah, no, 100%. And it's like, how do I, how do you get your work, you know, on there? And, you know, because using dark room, you know, which is great for the prints, but like, how can we take that to another notch where I can take that work? Don't put on dark room and, or maybe you do, I don't know what, how the rights work for that, but like, then it's on there. Yeah, and, and I think that's the piece. And I think that's sort of what also must be interesting from the music community. It's like, what happens to the rights? Like, is it still your music or was it like crazy? You sold your Beatles catalog to Sony. Like, yeah. what is it? Um, and I and I think that's what's got me on the edge. But once again, I think about like the photos I post and I think, I don't know why I'm being so defensive about the creative rights of a photo when the minute you've posted it on Instagram, you've already given your rights off to the platform to do whatever you want it wants with it. Yeah, I didn't even think about that shit. <laughs> yeah, like if you read the terms and conditions of Instagram and you think about the fact that they're putting ads nearby your photos, they're already monetizing your work and you're not getting a cent out of it. Well, just to put it out into the extreme. Yeah, right? no, it's a good, it's a good, you know, midnight thought. I'm going to think about this tonight. And I'm going to be like, <laughs> holy shit, what am I? The, yeah. the thing here is that, you know, that's sort of what's so promising about blockchain. And I think it is futuristic is that we're decentralizing the platforms and just making it part, like once again, like part of the ether of like, it's all interconnected, all codified, you know, all private. And like, it's all like generating more money as it goes. But to your point, it's like, do I have to pay money to this platform? Do they get a revenue share? But yeah, I mean, but this is, the, this is what's going to happen every time a new platform comes up. And what's interesting, though, is that, you know, it all goes back to like, we it's never been a best, better moment to be a creator. Never. You could have never, like, think about like the photographers we look up to in the 60s, the 70s, or the 80s. They were struggling check by check. Mm -hmm. We can say like, hey, I know a friend who sold a, a piece of photo for a million dollars. And you're like, holy crap, like that's a possibility. It's like when people told you there were YouTubers and you were like, what? Yeah, it blows my, or like, you know, an artist that made it and you're like, yeah, fuck, like it's, but like, you're happy, but like, but yeah. that's the thing, right? Like, it's never been a better moment to be a creator. Like you can make money. There's platforms to upload. It is a scary concept but we should all kind of hold our hands and, you know, take steps together to figure out if it's, if it's uh, do or don't. Um, but I'll, I'll say this, nothing would make me prouder than one day having my work hanging on a gallery versus having an NFT minted. Like that still for me feels very tangible and real. Oh yeah. And you should never give up because like, that's the thing. Anything is possible. Like that is right. Like it really is. And I'm just going to leave this here for everyone. Take it or leave it. Musicians will understand this. Photographers, if you listen to this, understand. It took Bill Withers, if you all know who that is. If you don't, please go look him up. Uh, he didn't make it until he the age of 40. Quincy Jones didn't get his big hit with Michael Jackson till the age 55. Like you, you can't just like, their age is irrelevant. You should not yeah. stop until your heart stops beating. Then, okay. I understand, but never give up. That is the dream. Yeah. Okay. Hell, you know, being an artist is actually the one thing you can do until your very last day. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think people need to recognize that and don't think it's like an age thing because it's not at all. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great way to wrap it up. I don't, I don't even want to say another word. That's it. That's the, yeah. the lesson out of it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sebastian, for coming on here. Uh, this was great. Um, definitely gonna I, I keep saying this to every photographer but like I want to do at some point get like a whole group one with everyone we all just talk that's the goal we get like everyone had already had on previously at some point we'll do a group one I think that'd be great with you all yeah no I mean glad glad if you consider me for joining that round table um, I, I'd be happy to a hundred percent and we look forward to the black and white film from you I am I'm not like what you said but that will happen we look forward to that uh, hold me accountable on January 1st 2023 hundred <laughs>
<laughs> Sounds good. Well, everyone, this is fantastic. Hope you enjoyed it. Keep thriving and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you so much, everyone.